Ridgekill Planning Board meeting will now come to order. Could I have a roll call? John Eichmann. Steve Caswell. Michael O'Brien. Lori G. John Cutler. Craig Smith. Ed Miyoshi. And if everyone would join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have two upcoming meeting dates, one on April 17th and one on May 15th. And bear with me, we have one set of minutes to approve. And it looks like um, Mike, Craig, Steve, John E. and Ed, you are all here. So do I have a motion, as, as well as myself, do I have a motion to approve the December 19th minutes? So moved. Second. A motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I abstain. And one abstention. Thank you, John. Okay, great. Um, the first item on our agenda tonight is the Stewart's amended site plan on Route 376. plan to put up on the overhead um Sit there michelle if you can great thank you That's good, Michelle. That works. Yep. All right, my name is Marcus Andrews. I'm with Stewart Shops. I'm here before the board this evening looking for uh, site plan approval. We're looking to remove the existing uh, front concrete curb area near the entrance to the existing shop located at 860 State Route 376 in Wappinger Falls. Uh, we'd be replacing um, that front planter area really would just we'd pay we'd go flush with it all around we replace it with the concrete ramp stamp concrete ramp uh, the addition of two bollards two four inch steel bollards with plastic covers on them um, mostly just to protect the entrance uh, from oncoming traffic and um, keep the drive lane the width that it is today people tend to drift off widen up if there is no curved island there. Um, we'd also are proposing there are uh, planters along the sidewalk on each side of the existing shop that we'd be looking to fill in with concrete. Um, these planters end up unfortunately becoming ashtrays, uh, which become difficult to clean out. Uh, we'd be looking just concrete them flush, match the sidewalk elevation. Um, that's in summary. What we'd be looking to do, this is just a photo of what exists today and what, this is obviously a different shop, a similar feature of what we'd be proposing to do uh, in that. I, it won't be exact, but it, it does give you an overall view of what it will look like. Okay. Did you want to see that closer, Scott, or did you want yeah. to? Oh, I thought you were giving him a standing ovation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
Michelle, I know you gave us a, a comment letter for this, and it seems like a fairly small um, change to the site plan. If you want to just quickly run us through, and sure, I think a lot of the improvements are really to help with um, also with ADA accessibility. Um, they would currently keep the site currently has 24 spaces and one handicap space, and is compliant with ADA requirements. And the proposed uh, improvements would just improve the accessibility on the site. The um, only thing is that they would be removing some existing landscaping. Right. Um, and I believe um, the building department also went out to the site and found that maybe they were not in complete compliance with some of the landscaping that is current that was currently required on their site plan. So the one thing. Um, the planning board may want to consider is seeing if they might be willing to put some additional landscaping in on the site. Okay. And is this where the, um, there was a picnic table, I think, in, in place of where there was supposed to be some other either shrubbery or, or trees? Okay. Are you, are you familiar with the site enough to know what we're talking about? Yes. Or is, okay. Yes. I do believe the original plan for this front plan or one of the sides was either pavers or a stamped concrete with the other side being green space for uh, some form of low shrub or perennial. Um, not exactly sure what happened, if it was like that from the day we built, but both sides ended up being the stamped concrete. So I, so I think we're not talking about the planters, right? We're talking about the side of yeah, the property some, where there's a picnic table right now. Offset the thing. Because you're right, I don't. Shall I can't can see a, where it is a shrubbery a lasting a snowstorm. Like with <laughs> this area. Are we talking this area here? I think it was in this area here. Yeah. yeah. If you turn it around, the picture's on. Turn it around. Yeah, but I think there's the picnic table. There, there, there was a picnic table here. But they were it, out of compliance with their original site plan. So do you know where the landscaping was shown on the original site plan? Here, on one of them. I'm not exactly okay. sure which one. So that's the issue. That the originally there was the original site plan had one plantings on one side, picnic table on the other. Correct. Some <laughs> at some point during construction or after construction, that got removed and um, the pavers table. or okay. stamped concrete got put in. Okay. Are you planning to leave the picnic tables there? Uh, there probably be a room for, and uh, there might be room for for two. Yes. <coughs> In this area. Okay. Um, Is that going to block the entryway for? No more. No more than this five foot ramp. It would leave the five foot ramp in that middle. It doesn't defeat the purpose of what you're Seems like it does. That's why I'm, yeah. The main purpose we're trying to accomplish is get rid of trip hazards. Right. Right. These, these ramps end up being, you put this picnic table, this picnic table here, you step off the picnic table, you've got trip edges all around stepping down off it to where picnic, picnic table here, it's flush everywhere to step off of. Yeah, but on that same token, at least at low speed or accidentally a car hopefully won't jump that curb to hit somebody sitting at the picnic table. Once you put it out in that area, you've removed a curb, a car could accidentally back into it. Which is why bollards are being, which is why we're proposing bollards. You have to load up with bollards, not just um, at the corners, but maybe in the middle too. I Agree. I, I agree, but or, or alternatively, we won't have picnic tables. Alternatively, on the side. no picnic tables. I I, so I, I agree, but I don't think there's unless you bollard it like crazy, right. you're not going to stop a vehicle. Right. Unfortunately, we've had a number of buildings be hit. We do now. But well, we're talking buildings versus no, people. Uh, no, exactly. But they do jump. Unfortunately, jump the curbs. Um, it's. It's an unfortunate. Have the picnic tables there. Yeah. That's an uh, that's an easy option. Okay. To uh, I'm fine with agreeing that. Okay. And then again, just you say you already got the bollards in the corner. There's right? bollards in the corner that protect these these posts there. Right. There's yep. two bollards there, <clears throat> okay. or one on each side. Is that sufficient, Scott? From your. Yeah, I think so. uh, okay. All right. Michelle, I know if we're removing landscaping, is there any other place on the site where we would want to add landscaping or are we fine with the way? I don't want to affect anybody's visibility coming on or off the road or anything like that. So I'm not sure there's a lot of 
um, places on this plan where you might put anything else in. And I'm not sure that there is either. I think it's just to, to note that it was removed and. Okay. <clears throat> Bear with me, I'm making a couple of notes. Okay. Um, Michelle, is there anything else that we should go over with this request? You said the parking itself isn't changing, so we're still, the site's still in compliance with its parking plan. Yeah, I think they're just restriping the handicapped area, right? And that's fine. Thank you. It, it will require restriping just with the removal of that. Um, there will be some pavement work to be redone so yes one thing i'd like to add i'm not quite sure from what source i heard it from but there was some potential issue about cars that go from the adjoining plaza mm. and whether they they cut through here to exit or vice versa uh, have you been made aware of any any issues like that and any, any possibility of maybe putting a speed bump between the two uh, parcels i have not been made aware of that no Scott, to that, that point, I mean, the issue with um, coming into that site, the land is depressed in that, that area, so it actually slopes down. So it's actually safer if you're going get, leaving that site from, from the um, eastern side, yeah, the eastern side of the property, and you're trying to, the line of sight is poor to your left, so people will cut through the other property because it's, raised up higher cut through into the plaza property yeah. versus trying to exit this exactly mm -hmm. so i don't know if you could put additional um, asphalt there to kind of raise that air if you you assess it you'll you'll see what i mean if you have a you know a small small vehicle it's tough to <clears throat> your line of sight is poor to the, what is to the, the issue what is it the adjoining properties landscaping that's the problem it, uh, the, it's the hedgerow i think the hedgerow. i know we've you got the hedges. You try to stay on top of him to keep it trimmed down. So I don't know if we need to just visit that. It's site. not even that. It's the just the uh, property itself. On, on Stewart's, it's it's a bit it's maybe like two feet lower. Or mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I haven't measured it. But I, I would uh, assume you're talking the, the other one. Here, here. That one. That one is lower than the other side. I think I am not. I've been to the site. Not an extreme you know aware of all that all those issues yeah, this um, is yeah. I do know raising that is not an easy process as far as you're regrading pretty much you're affecting this canopy to regrade right, this right. whole area just to affect storm water wise so um, it is something we can look at but I can't promise an easy answer for that yeah. Scott is that something you would want to condition for if the board agrees, this is a minor site plan amendment, we would take motion tonight. So is that? That we visit uh, the necessity for a speed bump between the two parcels and, and maybe modifying the profile onto? Yeah, I'm asking you if you till want. Until we, we have time to look at it. I mean, I'm fine with that if I, I get a condition. I, again, I can't see changing that being an easy issue. That That's going to affect the majority of this lot to change that. Yeah. Well, it's if that's true, issue. but that's what we'll determine when we go out to the field and take a hard look at it. We're not going to ask you to regrade the whole site. You know, it's a matter if you can bring a little shim in there and just, you know, we'll have to take a look. There are structures there as far as catch basins, which right. I'm assuming because we'll be it's a low spot. We'll be reasonable. If there's something that's a simple fix, we'll, we'll do it. As a part of a minor change, are you sure that's really warranted? Well, it was brought up. I mean... Uh, if if you have a low profile car, it is it's it's dang, it's a dangerous left turn out of there. You have full line of sight to the to the right, or looking west, but east you're sitting down okay. lower. Just I, I would say if Scott Scott can take a look at it and uh, assess it. And you know, alternatively, you could put a post a no left turn sign, but I think that gets even more. Yeah, circulation. Then people would really yeah. cut through then. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments? 
Okay. Michelle, this <coughs> this appears to be a fairly minor site plan change. Does the board agree this is a fairly minor change? We can, if we, if we do, we can act on it by motion. Otherwise, we would need to hold it over for a formal resolution. I'd like to ask that if, if it proves that it is, you know, a substantial change, that you come back. Right? If you're not happy with the recommendations, that you come back. Uh, words, I, on the whole elevation change. Uh, on the whole elevation change, I do believe if it becomes to be a major issue, we will be back. Because yeah. I, I really can't see how you can change that I, without really shutting down <coughs> both sites exactly. for a long time. Exactly. Again, I think if, if it's something that where it's tripping shrubbery or something like that, if they're to make visibility easier, I think it's worth the, the site visit to make that happen. Um, but I would agree if there's any major changes being proposed, Scott, I can't imagine that's where we'd be headed on this anyway. But if there was, you certainly always can come we back. We have to see what us. the curb line falls like, the drainage line. I'm not suggesting that they regrade the whole parking lot, but I'm if it's you. a matter of bringing in, you know, five ton of blacktop and just shimming it up and raising the elevation a little bit without changing the drainage, without changing the curbing and, and keeping it limited to just the entrance, I don't think, you know, that would be unreasonable to ask if there's a site distance issue. Can we separate okay. the two and give permission to proceed with the... I mean, there's a standard, you know, measurement for site distance, talking. and either they conform or they don't, so... Can we Which, separate the two and basically say why don't we give permission to go ahead with the, the change in the in with the, uh, the curb, but then make this a separate change that if they if they can't find a mutually agreeable solution, to come back with. These entrances were originally approved by DOT. Well, on paper, any changes? You know whether they were uh, constructed. I, I don't know. I honestly don't know. But it was a concern that was raised. I think we need to look into. That's all I can say. We've talked about it. All right, so okay. any other discussion, questions? Okay, so do I have a motion to approve minor site plan improvements to the Stewart's 860 Route 376 site? Um, as follows, removing the existing front entrance curb ramp and replacing it with stamped concrete, installing two bollards at the end of the stamped concrete area, filling in the planters on the sidewalk <coughs> with concrete, and uh, removing picnic tables from the site. And that would be a motion subject to a building department review of the egress visibility and if any changes would be required to the plan for that, any significant changes required to the plan for that, the applicant will come back before us. Engineering department. Sorry, not, engineering not department. Not department. Sorry. So you're keeping the approval contingent on their review? On their site visit, yes, just to see if there's anything else needed. And if there was anything else needed, you can come back to us for that piece of it. Anything else needed as far as that entrance is concerned, correct? Correct. Right. Correct. I can meet you Thursday or Friday if you want. Just so we, I won't, won't be able to meet you next week, so. Friday may work. Okay, you let me know. Okay. I'll touch base. Okay. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the next item on our agenda tonight is the iTooth amended site plan on Route 82. Michelle, if I can trouble you again, I want to make sure we have a copy of the plan. Up the, sorry. Hi, my name is Bob Hamill. I'm with Solar Plus Group located in Hopewell Junction. Uh, I represent iTooth, uh, located at 1123 Route 82. Uh, in April of last year, I presented an application in order to construct a 17 kW ground mount system in the rear of the property. And I come to learn that the client did not have approval for a parking lot in the rear. So I was asked to obtain an as-built survey so that I can present it to the board. Um, subsequently, last week I found out that there are a couple other items outstanding, which is there's a charging station on the property that never obtained a permit. Um, there's some ADA work that needs to be done in the front of the building to remove a no parking zone that prevents, or it's actually in the way of, the access road that gets to the back of the parking area. 
and there was some signage, front signage, um, that didn't obtain a... The sign was changed. The right? sign was changed without approval. And I think you have a, there's a vehicle, a boat stored in the yeah, back? Yeah, there's a the boat site. stored in the back. So all these additional things that have come up, I have discussed with Dr. Perrier. Okay. And he agrees that, all right, we need to address these changes. Okay. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, can we separate the issue of getting approval for constructing a solar system and still work on the process of getting the site plan approved uh, that now incorporates all these additional changes. One of the, I, I'm sorry, I don't mean to answer a question with a question, but one of the other issues was the septic. Were we, <laughs> were we about to build a solar farm on top of a septic system? Do you know where the septic is for this thing? Uh, the septic is, it's, actually it's not on this site plan, but I do have older versions of the site plan that shows that the septic is located to the southern portion of the property. Okay, so um, it's not underneath where you're putting the solar farm. That's, that's correct. the only question. Okay, thank And you. one of the additional things that we did to ensure that we weren't gonna disturb the property is that this will be a ballasted ground mount so it doesn't penetrate the ground at all. It's actually sitting on concrete piers above ground. Okay. Yeah, but those piers go into the ground. No. They rest on top of the ground. They just sit, sit. Right. It's called the pour in ground. place foundation. Yeah. Um, on top of the ground. On top of the ground. So when the frost moves, these things just kind of float with the frost. Is that the idea? They just. Uh, they can, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they're constructed so that there's flexibility in it to accommodate that, that movement. Movement. Okay. You said they can. Is that what's planned here? I'm sorry. Your answer to Scott was that they can be built to absorb the frost heat. Oh, is it is built to accommodate built the frost heat. Okay. So in the event that you ever had to dig them up or whatever, you can just move them? You could theoretically move them. Okay. Right. Now my question really is, I'm sorry, go ahead, Pat. The charging station does have a building permit. It was taken out in the fall of last year. Has a building, is it a closed building permit? Yeah. And it didn't get a site plan, minor site plan amendment? That wouldn't, no. no, it didn't. Okay. okay. So we can change the site plan to include the charging station, as well as I think there's a fourth AC unit that I, maybe Bob Oswald made a, uh, you know, he put three units on the drawing instead of four? Yeah because I don't think it was constructed or uh, installed since we did the survey. So I think that was an oversight on his part. Okay. Um, Michelle, do you want to just walk us through the parking on the site and your comment letter? Sure. And then we can go so, on to other questions. So um, as we stated, the site plan currently is not in compliance with the approved site plan in part because there was a, a parking lot that was constructed, and I don't know if we know the exact year, but I looked at the historic aerials, and it was sometime between um, prior to 2009, but after 2004, <laughs> sometime in that time period. And it may have been gravel originally and then paved. I couldn't, I couldn't tell. It looked like it went through a couple of iterations. But the parking lot was, was created. It was not created um, probably to how we would expect a parking lot to be created if we were going to review an entire site plan. In other words, um, there's a kind of a one-way access to it and it's relatively narrow and um, I think they have they've um, limited it to employee parking um, and it it sort of runs along the side of the property and into the back and um, so so basically we, we discovered that when they submitted for their uh, solar panels that this this parking lot existed that wasn't on the originally approved site plan and then um, the solar panels themselves, um, we would treat as a structure and they would meet all the setbacks and would be located behind the medical office building and would, wouldn't really be visible. So I think we have less a concern with the visibility of that than we do with the existing issues that are on the site plan now currently. And the parking seems to meet the requirements, the parking in the front of the site seems to meet the requirements for the patients but not for 
the employees. So in other words, they need that excess parking for the employees in the medical office. Kevin, remember how many spots do they need and how many do they have um, with the things in the back? I could have to count that for you. I don't have it right in front of me right okay, second, I, I, but I can get that for you. That's fine, but the, but the point is they, there is enough parking as long as we incorporate the back. Correct. We need the back, I think, to make the parking. You know, on other site plans, we've certainly designated difficult to reach spots as employee only parking. Correct. And I believe there's a sign that says there's a sign that restricts the parking to some extent. Correct. Right, 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 right. There. Restricts it up to employee only, only. Or yeah, I believe. Yeah. And I think we should include signs on both ends of the building, showing that it's one way access, so you don't run into any issues. The head on collision in a parking lot. One of the issues I think too was the. Uh, I'm sorry, lawyer. Let me, no, go ahead. Uh, since these are not going to be up on a building, is there going to be a glare issue at eye level, um, and would screening be appropriate? Well, the modules are going to f are at a 35 degree angle, facing south. So it's actually at the opposite end of the parking lot. So there wouldn't be any glare in the parking lot. What Since about everything's the, facing south. I think there are homes behind it. There's a, there's a hedgerow, but then there's homes behind it. Is there any? Uh, the homes are completely, uh, well, actually, the property is surrounded by shrubs and trees. Okay. Okay. Thank you. But you have enough clearance for the sun to actually hit the panels? You're, you're positioning yeah, exactly. it so that you're going right. to get sufficient power generation? Right. That's, that's one of the first things we do when we propose a solar system is to do a solar irradiance to ensure they're getting at least 80% of the sun's potential. And the screening shrubbery that you're referring to, is that, um, is that evergreen or deciduous? What, so it, is it screened year round? <clears throat> um, wasn't actually proposing any screening. No, these are existing. I know, but you no, said but it's, these existing. Are only, it's, they're, they're evergreens. It's, it's, it's a combination of yeah. trees. Uh, some are evergreens on the north side, on the west side. Ha have it's you looked at it, Michelle? Are we comfortable that this isn't going to pose any? The closest neighboring property owner, the closest pro residential property, it's mostly evergreens right. protecting okay. that line. The rest of it um, is a mixture of deciduous and evergreen trees. And it does look like, and there's also a shed that also, um, on one of the neighboring properties, it also blocks the view. Part of, of the, the view? Yeah. OK. Okay. And the full height of the system is about 10 feet, so it's it's not that high up off the ground. Leading edge is three feet. Okay. Mike, did you have any other items? No, those are the points. Thank you. Okay. So, Michelle, with the site being right now out of compliance are our next steps to have the have the applicant address that more formally on the plan or I request the change in writing with what's I don't know if we can set this for public hearing or if we need to wait for that to yeah I think we need to to get the site plan in compliance I don't know if it's is it an order of remedy right now from the building department do you know Pam it's been sure. issued so I think they've they've gone. The building department has gone out. They've noted the violations and they've asked them to correct those violations. So I think we need to have, um, and and certainly some sort of. Um, I know that you, the survey that you recently provided was supposed to be an as-built survey, but it didn't show the stuff that they then. Right, it's missing one AC unit right. and the charging station. Right. Okay. So I'll update that. And the parking, because it's not, I don't think the rear parking lot is approved at all yet, right? No, it isn't approved, but we asked them to show it and the lot to be approved as part of this application. As part of this, yeah. but we need to make sure that, that the egress and ingress to that employee lot is clear on the site. Correct. So you and just have to, right. you know, whatever you need to note on the site for the signage you'll install, or if there's striping, you know, arrows or something to be put on the pavement, something to make it clear so we don't you have two cars trying to enter a very narrow drive at the same time. So I can indicate the signage on both sides of the building, but how, how about ADA requirements for the, the parking spots themselves? You want that denoted? It? Please, yeah. Scott, the applicant is proposing to address the um, items from the uh, 
letter regarding the out of compliance uh, items from the site plan mm -hmm. to address them with this application, revising the application a little bit just to make sure that all of the things that were noted are addressed and um, included in this application. Is there anything else that we need to discuss as far as that goes or any other concerns that you have with that? I mean, we're proposing as far as to, oh, sorry. What was the resolution on the boat? Did they so, give you a timetable? Because we can give them some time, I mean, to comply with that. Yeah, we didn't talk about the boat. That's right. <coughs> the boat will be removed. Just need a time frame. <coughs> Need a month, need I, two months. I mean, just I'll as long have to as talk. we know that we it's can. It's Dr. Cigna's boat. I'll have to reach out to him and see when it can get removed. Okay. Alternatively, we're going to have it to stop you know, snowing. Hopefully know, soon. We could bring him in as a violation. <laughs> I don't want to do that, but. Okay. Other than that, though, the charging station, the extra AC unit, and the flagging of the rear lot as employee parking, and placing it on the plan. I think we've got the plan showing that parking now. Okay. We're just going to make sure that we address those a couple of other things. Okay. Um, before we bring it back in for public hearing. I, th I think the only thing there's a, isn't there a, um, like a little pump station in the back? Is there a, for the sanitary? Is there a pumping station? I see a vent coming out of a structure. I'm assuming that's some kind of pump station. I haven't noticed a pumping station. Did <clears throat> on the southern part of the property? In the rear, where the rear in part In the rear, lies, southern where, part. Where your solar panels are going to go. But my point is, I guess the parking lot was put in, <clears throat> and whether or not that structure needs to be protected with bollards or something like that, which is something we could take a look at. Okay. And Scott, you can work with your air, your department to help identify what may need to be added yep. to the plan. Yep. Any changes to the okay. plan? Okay. Yep. Thanks. Okay. All right. Um, anything else for this one? You'll need to just come back to us one more time with all those adjustments on the plan, and then we can set you for public hearing. Okay, great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hang in there. <laughs> and I think you have, and I'm sorry, just, I'm sorry, one more thing. <laughs> you have the comment letters from our professionals, correct? There's one from Morris Associates and one from Michelle. Okay, perfect. Okay. The next item on our agenda is Hopewell Sports Dome site plan on Route 52. Good evening. Good evening. My name is David Veda. I am an architect working with Brian Brown Architects on behalf of the Kingdom Project. I'm assisting with the approvals process on the site plan along with the internal clubhouse structure. Firstly, the town of East Fishkill has been integral in providing the necessary direction and guidance in assisting this design team to finalize and develop the site to its full potential in accordance with all local and state guidelines. The team is wrapping up all observations included, but not limited to, the inclusions of comments expected tonight at this evening's board meeting so that an official site plan may be granted. The submission of the internal clubhouse structure will be submitted to Mr. Bryant and Mr. Renia, who is completing the peer review on April 13th, 2018. We're addressing some minor comments and some life safety concerns which have now been resolved and are implementing and coordinating these on the permit drawings. We anticipate the assistance and expected review from Rennie and Associates with the assistance of Mr. Bryant, a building permit that can be issued concurrently with the approved site plan bringing the project to fruition and operational sometime September or October of this year. In summary, having met and fulfilled the requirements set forth before the town board and any additional considerations tonight, we are excited to present the realization and the revitalization of East Fishkill with the Sports Kingdom. Um, with that, I'd like to inter, uh, introduce Chris Lapine from Chase and Companies, who's going to address any site comments that uh, the board may have. Okay. Thank you.
Good evening, members of the board. Um, I think everybody's aware of this project. You granted site plan and subdivision approval on October 21st, 2014. The subdivision was filed in June of 2015. Site work began in 2000, March of 2015, and the foundation work began in October of 2016. All the while, uh, the team was still trying to address the outstanding comments uh, related to the site plan approval. Um, the construction has not gone as anticipated. I think we can all agree to that. Uh, the team's extremely disappointed, as well as the town. Um, there is a number of unexpected setbacks that were encountered. Uh, the partners have worked diligently in trying to address those. They've developed a revised strategy and schedule for moving forward. Uh, Dave uh, alluded to some time frames earlier in his discussion. Uh, once again, they want to reiterate how patient the town's been in assisting the applicant moving forward with the project despite the setbacks. They're determined to maintain this new schedule. Uh, the expectation, as Dave said, is that they're looking to uh, have this project completed by the end of this year. This application now and the applicant is more focused on moving uh, forward with this and rather than dwelling on the hindrances that have uh, created those setbacks before them. What I wanted to share with the board tonight was from the time you last approved this project, uh, the team's been working with Morris Associates, uh, the town planner, and Hudson Valley Engineering. And there's been some changes to what was approved by the town. And what I did on this uh, plan here, which we've got blown up, and it's a little difficult to see, but uh, I also have the rendering here on the uh, easel here to kind of walk through is I want to walk through some of the changes that have developed from since the last time. What hasn't changed is the size of the dome. It's still the same, almost eight acres. The parking hasn't changed for the site. It's still uh, 312 on site, 500 uh, off site which meets the parking regulations. Uh, there were a number of outstanding comments from Morris Associates related to the stormwater pollution prevention plan and the erosion cement control plans. Uh, uh, dialogue with Pete Zotero has indicated that we're in a good place right now where they feel comfortable. There's some minor tweaks, but nothing that's going to change the substance of the design that's, that's put forth. So you still have a SWIP that you're submitting to us, or does he have a final proposal? He, he has a uh, he has a SWIP, and I believe the uh, comment letter that came last Thursday from his office. There were a few minor comments in terms of dressing up some appendices that are in there, and uh, we've already began working on that. Okay. Some of the minor changes in this was. And they're really insignificant to the overall project. The previous project was proposed with asphalt curbing throughout the entire project. Based on the extensive maintenance that's going to take place in snow removal, the applicants decided to switch to a concrete type uh, curbing throughout for longevity and durability. The This particular area over here, and let's start with the northwest corner here. This area was basically, uh, you had the roof dropping down into kind of a paved area with additional pavement here, and then we had parking. There was a monotony of pavement in impervious area in this particular location. One of the changes that were taking place between site plan and refining it with the construction plans was there was an introduction of um, a couple of catch basins along this <laughs> corridor. The parking was shifted a bit to the west here. And this area, which was previously proposed to be impervious, has been opened up to be uh, a bar retention area, where we have the ability to also incorporate some additional landscaping in it and serves as a runoff reduction practice which help address some of the concerns raised by Morris Associates. We also ran a sidewalk along this corridor here, and to try to break up the pavement, 
sections between the two, we've introduced a stamped pavement section here to navigate uh, the pedestrians that are coming from the overflow parking. Similarly speaking, we had some other modifications in the southwest corner here. Um, we had parking almost up against the building here, and we had no opportunities for green space. We had a kind of an, we had an island here between the parking, but the island was all concrete paved. It was serving as a sidewalk. So what we did was we shifted, once again, the parking to the west. All the stormwater was flowing in a direction towards the actual dome itself. We incorporated another bar retention area here with some additional landscaping. And we also took a, uh, a sidewalk that started routing pedestrians away from the parking and alongside of the building. So we, we did a couple of things by providing the pedestrians with a safer means of travel. And we've also provided some greenscape into this and managed some of the stormwater concerns by introducing bar retention areas on the side of the site. There was also some collaboration between uh, the partners in uh, Royal Carding as to the actual solid waste that's going to be generated. Uh, it was recommended that a compactor be introduced into the project area. Slight modification to this refuse enclosure area where a compactor was introduced with some recycling bins. And um, as is the case, when you're introducing a compactor, you should have a concrete surface as opposed to an asphalt surface. So that was another change that was made. There were some concerns raised by various consultants as it relates to the stormwater management basins uh, located in the, uh, in the front here and on the western side here. Uh, some of the slopes were proposed to be uh, stabilized with a field stone or a riprap. Uh, concerned about the aesthetics of that. Uh, we were able to regrade some of these slopes uh, to be uh, a slope that's conducive to establishing grass with some erosion control matting. Uh, so that was some changes we introduced in the uh, northern portion and the western portion of the site. Another change that was made was the previous plan had all these islands in the front were all concrete sidewalks within them that were approved. The limited landscaping was on the northern side and these little bit of uh, islands out front, but each one had a sidewalk up the middle of it that was five feet wide. Uh, we started thinking about the fact that cars are going to be probably parking over the curb, encroaching into the sidewalk area, and that would reduce that to about three feet. Then we started thinking, well, the parking actually takes place at like a Galleria. Most people walk up the drive aisle as opposed to in the center along a concrete curb. What that allowed us to do was we eliminated that concrete curbing, which reduced the impervious area in the front of the site by over 6,000 feet. I, re I recall from working on orthopedic associates, I also recall during the review of this application, anything that can be done to reduce the impervious area that contributed to the pond would be a benefit to the people of Lake Village. The portion of the property here on the east side for building uh, fields three and fields four, um, the town had asked for, there was always some sort of a topographic difference there that had to be uh, achieved by the use of retaining wall. There is a modular block design that's been presented to the town that's now become part of the overall plan set, and that's another change that was incorporated. The, the concern on the front portion of the extended detention basin one and the extended detention basin here was based on the steep slopes adjacent to uh, South Drive and Research Drive. There were guide rails introduced in the event of cars possibly going off the road that would prevent them from going down the steep slopes. Each one of these ponds was fully enclosed with a post and rail fence and a steel mesh, uh, black coated one inch squares going around it to prevent uh, guests uh, from going down into the pond or any sort of animals. Chris, isn't there something very similar to that there now? I seem to recall it was like that. Back when IBM built those big, uh, the small, but with the huge cables. Yeah. I think some of them are for the guide rails, but some of them have been uh, 
impacted during the course of construction. Uh, one of the things they had to do was come in here and regrade this pond. So as a result, so it, and Scott brought up a, a valid point that you certainly need uh, some sort of guide rails along that corridor. And so that's being reintroduced. Okay, thank you. The guide rails on uh, the west side along uh, South Drive, these guide rails are going to be uh, installed and the materials are going to be to DOT standards in the event that the town ever decides to take ownership of the road. That's an option that the town has before them. Another slight modification was over here at the airlock area. And once again, it's, it's, you're not even going to notice that we just shifted the low point. The low point was actually against the airlock before. And because of the fact that it's going to be opening up and closing often, we shifted that away so no ponding occurs adjacent to the airlock area. Um, different sorts of pavement patterns were provided for this plan, which introduced heavy duty pavement for where areas where you're expected heavy loading from fire trucks or any sort of snow plowing equipment. And we had light duty pavement sections for where there's just general parking going. And we have uh, some concrete sections that we've provided. Um, and that's kind of the overall picture of the site plan changes that we've made. Uh, we're more than welcome to uh, entertain any questions, which I'm certainly the board uh, may have on this project. Okay. Um, let's, uh, do you have any sort of calculation that tells us how much you've reduced the pervious surface? In, in the front? Sorry, the impervious surface? In the front, we reduced it by 6,000 square feet. Okay. And what about on the side where you said you've now introduced the bioretention basin and some of the... Um, hmm. I'd say we, I don't have that number in my head. I'm, I'm okay. trying to work off of, I'd say we're probably in the 5,000 square foot range. Okay. Going back to Chris Spade, back of the garage Spade, it used to be double, the, it used to. Okay. Okay. That's about it. <laughs> for the, that's uh, fine. That's fine. That was my application. Sorry. <laughs> no, you're fine. <laughs> no worries. Right. Okay. Um, and Scott, I thought um, you had mentioned there was some other changes. Are there I'd other like changes to you're going to go over tonight? A few yeah. that, that I don't okay. think Chris got to, in, in, in no particular order. Uh, one is the original resolution included for the import of 7,000 yards of fill to complete the site work. And uh, I think now it becomes evident that they're going to have excess fill. I don't know that they know exactly what that quantity is. It, it's kind of substantial. So we're going to have to amend that permit to include the export of fill. Okay. Um, another item. W was any fill brought on site in anticipation, or was is all of the soil that we see there from the site itself? Uh, there has been fill brought on the site for the bedding in the foundations of okay. the uh, concrete footer going around the dome and also for uh, beneath the actual floor area. So that's, so the, that's more an exempt the, item though. Yeah. Structural okay. fills exempt, so. so. So there's a pile to the west and a pile to the east on the site right now, right? The, that's excavated material from the. That's excavated from the subject. From the okay. site, correct. All right. Okay. And that's, Scott, what you're talking about needs to be Mended. removed and. Once they get a better yeah. handle, but we know it's not going to be an import, it's going to be an export. We may want to know where it's going, how many truckloads, that kind of stuff. It's a pretty, as everyone sees, it's a pretty good pile, so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and there's, there's also, and, and, and Scott, you brought up a good point. There was, there was some regrading that took place over here, so we could probably run a new calculation on the cut and fill for this mm -hmm. uh, to give you that exact number. Okay. I mean, we can, I mean, being that it's kind of a large number, I think just a range would work. Yeah. We don't have to nail it down to the yard, but if we can get within, you know, oh. and just be a little conservative. I think it's more just number. understanding the period of time where we'll have the excess truck traffic and what we're, you know, roughly what we're expecting. That's usually what we've asked for. Right. Um, another item we've discussed is uh, kind of tightening up the, the lighting plan. There's, there's a couple areas that we had some concerns. Maybe Michelle wants to speak more to. Sure. Uh, go ahead, Michelle, if you want. Um, there are two staircases that lead back um, behind mm -hmm. the site toward, towards the overflow parking area, yeah. and we just wanted to make sure that there was uh, appropriate lighting there for, for safety and that people could see where they were going. Correct. And then um, along the dome, along the side of the dome from the parking area 
towards the front entrance, there um, was an adequate lighting. Uh, so we asked that we just add some lighting along that pathway, the pedestrian pathway, so that there's there's lighting wherever there's pedestrians going to be walking. Um, and then there were bollards proposed. Right here. Yep. And we just wanted to get a better sense of the illumination levels from those bollards um, and, and maybe you know, just make sure that we're consistent in the lighting so that we don't get any lighting glare or any major changes in, in lighting throughout the site. So I don't and know if you're still going to... for pedestrians, right, versus that was for vehicles. Pedestrians. So exactly. that, that's... Okay. Yeah, it was pedestrian lighting. So I don't know if you're going to stick with the bollards um, or if you're going to go back to... They had, um, I guess they were sort of like street lamp type lights in other locations. So maybe... We yeah, we have the street lamps all, along the Route 52 corridor here and then coming in... Uh, along the drive, and then this particular area was just the uh, small-scale bollards along the pedestrian path there, and then we came back to our regular bollards on site. Um, one of the other things that we're, and we're actually working with Musco right now on this. Okay. Uh, you've asked us to take the previous temporary lighting that was going into the overflow and provide you the photometrics mm -hmm. for that. So we're going to do that using the Musco uh, lighting fixtures. Okay, so they, they have temporary lighting that they were going to use in the overflow parking areas. You may re recall this from previous discussions. When they need to use the overflow parking areas, they want to bring temporary lights in so that people can see where they're going. And we just wanted the details of those temporary lights. And one of the other things I just wanted to bring up to the board is uh, the lighting on this side of the dome we had was based upon the actual tall mounted light uh, fixtures for the uh, ball fields. Mm -hmm. Since that's going to be a part of phase two, what we think we're going to do is use the similar style fixtures that we have in the parking lot just to illuminate this walkway along here so that's <coughs> something that's being worked on right now and that'll be incorporated into the lighting plan that you'll eventually see but just going back chris it was the intent that the ball field lights would be on in the winter time just to illuminate the path even though there's no baseball Correct. That's that, what, that was the uh, original intent. that was the original plan there's a couple of reasons design. to go back and revisit Correct. that yeah okay and you uh, mentioned phasing is has the phasing changed from the original Plan. No, the phase one uh, is the dome, all the associated parking and stormwater management facilities. Phase two is the actual uh, outdoor fields Installation and the artificial fields. turf. Okay. Um, one of the other things that we also discussed that we're in the process of doing is, if you recall, during the resolution, uh, there was a 10 or 12 inch water line that the town wanted to be identified at the early stages of construction to look at if it's something uh, viable in terms of uh, retaining for your future use. Um, this line has been damaged during construction. Some of it, uh, based on a condition, is not something that's viable to be used. There's discussions right now about placing a uh, future line as part of this phase one construction okay. in the event that the town Okay. eventually takes over the road and they have a new water line place. Okay. Scott, where was that pipe going? I mean, it came from the old IBM well field and went back to the storage uh, tanks or in that vicinity in the rear of the property. It wasn't we, part of the recent water project? No. No, it was, okay. remember the pump house that was out front here? Ah, right. yeah. Mm -hmm. from the okay. pump house back and then. Right. So the idea is if we could have repurposed that line, uh, that's what we were evaluating, but now we may just just replace it and incorporate it into the right of way. And we're, we're working through what kind of tweaks we can make with the overall uh, water water line plan to you know in incorporate that into it, make some adjustments. So we're working through that. The other thing, I guess, uh, a couple more items, if I may, Chris. Right. Um, if you recall, there was a what we call a, a cattle crossing, similar to Hopewell Glen yes. crossing, South Drive, that. Uh, you know, initially, we, th we thought things would have been built out by now. There wasn't much going on in the rear of parcel, but, you know, things are starting to, to warm up back there. So I had expressed a concern about installing it later rather than sooner and in the impact to the traffic on, on South Drive. Uh, the, the dome people started evaluating maybe an overhead structure, and they presented some ideas on that at our meeting. And then... From that, it kind of, uh, through some brainstorming and whatnot, we it kind of morphed into a possibly an at-grade crossing similar to the one that we have here at the Muse. Although uh, we were trying to incorporate more of a uh, 
red light feature versus just the flashing light feature. So that's another thing that we're, that we're looking at to try to incorporate. Is that, is that going to be far enough back that we don't have to worry about the light? Well, we, that would be part of it. Or there's part a, there's of a the fixed distance the that you have to be off 52? the DOT okay. road, which we think we can achieve. Okay. And, and if we go that route, we would also add one on Auditorium Drive. Or, and Research Drive at both of the crossings there. Yeah, and at Auditorium for the school children. Okay. This crossing that comes right over here. Right. So, so that's something that's in, we're working on now. And, and, so and, that tunnel is no longer on the table at all? Well. Or just still just researching I, I think in their mind it's no longer on the table. I think they run into some elevation issues. It really wasn't okay. engineered completely initially. Gotcha. It was kind of left for later on, but now we wanted to bring that yeah. and take a hard look at that. That was okay. one of the things uh, the team took a look at between the site plan approval and where we're at now. We actually started laying in the hard grades for it to be handicap accessible and what the wall heights were going to be, looking at particular tunnels, looking at the clearances because there is new electric being brought in, there is new gas being brought in, we have to have certain separation distances. Uh, and we, then we looked at what the impacts were on the west side where it created a <coughs> long, and, and actually I have a plan here. So looking at this plan here, this is where the actual entryway for pedestrians are for fields one and two over here. So individuals who are coming here would come across to the west side and then have to walk about 150 feet back just to get to the main entryway. Uh, and this would have been all retaining walls and uh, ramps with landings along the way. Uh, one of the benefits of this at grade crossing is if we can incorporate it at this particular location, which is the entryway into the fields, we gain a considerable amount of distance from the uh, intersection at the light as well, which would allow the queuing to take place on the property with less impacts to the uh, signal. And uh, as Scott said, it's a collaboration that's gonna have to take place with uh, Scott, Hudson Valley Engineering, and the uh, DOT. Okay. And then um, the last update is, I think, through the permitting process with DOT, it, it's come to light that uh, DOT wants that traffic light reactivated as, as part of yep. this project, not waiting some later date, but they, they want that traffic light operating when the CO is issued for the, for so, the sports dome. So we were informed in May of 2017 uh, that there had uh, been some back and forth between Hudson Valley Engineering and the DOT, and we were informed by the DOT at a meeting at their office that they wanted the existing light reactivated, <coughs> and they also asked if the signal loops could be replaced. Uh, one of the quagmires that we find ourselves in is uh, that particular light was owned by IBM uh, and it was transferred to Preferred Development. Preferred Development is the current owner of that light. So the owner of that light is the one that's responsible for making the changes. They're also responsible for paying the electric and the maintenance for it, which hasn't been paid in the last you know, 12 or 13 years to the DOT. Uh, so one of the things we're, we're working on right now, the DOT would allow uh, the Sports Dome uh, uh, partners to do the work on this light and, and potentially, I don't know if it's called an ownership or uh, basically they're the individuals that are paying the DOT to maintain <coughs> it and for the electricity to be provided to it. One of the concerns that the applicant has raised and we've raised this with the DOT is when the rear of the parcel develops and if there are further modifications needed to the light, who pays for that and who is responsible for paying for the additional, if there's any additional maintenance and uh, energy charges. Uh, we're trying to work that out. It's, it's in the applicant's legal counsel's hands. Uh, and I think we're looking at that as well. I have some updates correct. for you on that, but I think we I think we have something that'll that'll work for you. Yeah. And, and and one of it's our not unusual to do some sort of shared agreement for something mm -hmm. like that, right? So well, I think the intent would be for as long as it's only the sports dome utilizing that <coughs> signal, that they would bear the expense of operating it. Sure. But, but at the point in the future where 
there's other parcels that are developed and other users, and they would all share in that, and the town would get involved in orchestrating that. So, okay. so until that's squared away, the DOT won't approve any lighting modif traffic signal modifications. Because I think we can get that resolved in short order. That just to give you a, uh, an idea of where we're at with the DOT. Okay. Uh, we are um, we're down to the wire with the Department of Health. Uh, the only thing that's they gave us five additional comments. Um, three of them, which I have the information from Scott to give to the Department of Health. And the last one is they're just asking, uh, one of them's a minor tweak as a labeling issue on our plans. They've asked that an updated uh, hydrant test be conducted out on Route 52. Uh, the last <laughs> ones that were conducted were in 2014. So uh, we understand that that can't be conducted until April when it warms up this year and the uh, applicant's ready to go ahead and do that work. So we can provide it to the Department of Health and finalize our approval with them. Yes, I guess one other update is at the time of the original approval, uh, we did not have a connection point for, for sewer at the time. So, so since then, we've constructed our pump station. It's been a uh, certificate of completed works has been issued by the health department, and we're ready to operate. So, okay, so the site has completed. both water and sewer water available and sewer. to it now. Correct. Okay. All right. Um, just with regard to the building itself, and Scott, maybe you mentioned this and I missed it. I, I understood that there were originally some doors that weren't going to be constructed that now are or were incorporated into Yeah, that's a good point. Them. Yes, we discussed that. Maybe you want to... Doors? For, for egress. Egress. For large events. At one point, it was in the original plan, it was proposed for them to be uh, bulkheaded. I can, I can speak up to that. Yeah. Great. If, if you don't mind, just come, yeah, come up to the microphone for us. I prepared the response letter for um, the clubhouse and the uh, the dome drawing itself. Um, all of the doors were going to be installed immediately. There would be no um, openings with uh, blocked up and taken out at any special permit event. Um, all of those doors would be installed immediately, um, which makes it even easier for egress uh, purposes inside the dome structure itself. Okay. So I know at the time that we looked at this, we had talked about um, the ability to host large events and things like that. These, the purpose of these doors would still be to allow egress upon conclusion of an event like that or turnover of like teams or something That's like that. That's correct. And that would be based okay. on special permit. Okay. Completely separate from the daily use. Right. So, so just, um, just to reiterate, and I, cause it's been a while since we've yeah. seen this, you know, at the point where you're having at the site, one of these special events is you're still going to need to work with the town to make sure that there's adequate traffic controls and things like that. Absolutely. So there may be conditions on a permit like that or limitations based on what you're proposing in times of day and that sort of thing. And we're ready to comply with okay. whatever is there, okay. constraints are. Is there any updates on that point? I mean, do you foresee any large events sooner rather than later once you're open now that things are... There's nothing booked as of right now. Okay. Uh, I think it'd be hard to say we're going to schedule a concert until we have everything no i just didn't know if you know a few years down the road now that no i i, I think that or you have more plans and there's plans. a lot of excitement um about the dome itself um and i spoke to the owners uh earlier this dome is a lot bigger than anybody can possibly imagine in this room um the effect uh that it's going to have on east fishkill in the state of new york people around Connecticut and New York are talking about it um, and people are excited about it and that's a great thing. I was going to say for what it's worth it's tough to live in this area and not be part of the anticipation of that. Thing. It's, it's, it's exciting. It's thrilling. So. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, lastly at our meeting was discussed the possibility of putting a storage shed on a site. Is there any more discussion taking place on that? Yeah, right now with regards to the storage shed, uh, their focus is in this particular area, uh, which is away from all the activity in the front. Okay. So you've talked about a lot of tweaks to the plan. I don't think, at least nothing I heard seems alarming. In fact, I, I hear you making improvements to the plan that are probably going to make the site more usable and um, I like the reduction in impervious surface. 
although it's probably minor in comparison to the whole it, thing. But it's minor, but uh, I think the people of Lake Village would appreciate it. Uh, every little helps. Absolutely. Well, they also added bio retention yeah. areas, so you know, you couple that with a reduction in impervious, so they have made some gains right. or decreases, I guess, is yeah. the case. That yeah. Um, so, Chris, when are you thinking you're going to have a final plan resubmitted to us? And um, you know, we, we need to move forward to review those more formally with the board. Um, Michelle, I guess I'll look to you. Does this, these changes, many of them would have been considered, I think I'm going to call it a, in the field sort of construction type changes, but a couple of them wouldn't be like the crossing and things like that. So I'm assuming we're going to need to put it back into a public hearing. So we would need final plans. We'd need to be able to um, move along in that direction. So what's your timing as far as being able to finish all the revised plans and get them resubmitted? Uh, we are, I, I think, our, our only outstanding one that, uh, well, all, let me just take a step back. All the changes I spoke of earlier, they were part of the submission package. I know, but you said you have things uh, like the cross, like the street the crossing, crossing, like the light, and the like water the lighting lines, plan, and yeah, some other the things updates that you don't no, have nailed down those, yet. Those, those came out of a recent meeting that okay. were past our smell. So I just, I just wanted to just clarify that some of the earlier changes I talked about. Uh, I'm sorry, I, those were understood. Done. Okay. Understood. Uh, we are, we're probably three weeks away from dressing everything up. Uh, Musco is probably two weeks is what they've informed us. Uh, and we want to get our arms around this crossing signal as well. It's not something that to say standard detail. It's mm -hmm. something that's going to require a little thought and design that goes into this. Okay. So. It's okay. like a month. Just uh, yeah. if I may, I, I don't sure. know that we're still beyond the limits of a, of a minor amendment given the, the magnitude of the project. Uh, that I think the larger things are the activation of the traffic light, which was discussed during the secret yeah. process. It's just kind of just moving that ahead a little bit. Uh, we're potentially eliminating a cattle crossing to an at-grade crossing, but I don't know that in and of itself would trigger a public hearing. So I just, you know, maybe want to just have a little discussion on that, whether that's, we really need a public hearing. That's fair, but we just went through about 15 or 20 different changes we're making to the plan. Yeah, so. but a lot of that was in, re in response to, you know, outstanding comments from, from Morris and myself, you know, getting them cleaned up and incorporated into a okay. final plan. So I don't think there's, I mean, we're not adding a ball field. Uh, there's no increase substantially in lighting, right, They're visible from I mean, 52. Most of the so, lighting so, Michelle, I mean, what about the change to the drainage with bioretention basins and things like that? We don't have to recircular anything or... I bring I think I mean the way we don't I have to I know this. we're kind of talking about this for the first time tonight if we need time to think about it I'm okay with that but well I think the the area that we're showing was already shown as disturbed area so it's if anything the bioretention brings it back more to a natural yeah, condition the, the, than it than the yeah. impervious surface so I think that's a net gain the, the and how do we revise a cut and fill permit without having a public hearing um I don't know, Tom, can we amend a cut and fill permit without from, from fill to Well, cut. yeah, I granted one. <clears throat> I'd have to take a look at the cut and fill, but I, I would agree. Because we're going with, in the opposite direction now. They were bringing know, fill on site, and now Scott, they're removing significant res fill. With respect to the other changes, while in a smaller project, they would see substantial, I think, in this magnitude, it's, it's minor details. And uh, such things as the, the basin change and everything are really things that as a project progresses could be uh, done at various times so Just back I to agree the much of it would could have been considered I don't think field it's the changes. type of uh, thing you could approve by a verbal motion but, by the but board, we're also but. removing sidewalks from a parking area we're doing a lot of and and I don't necessarily disagree with that anybody who's ever been to a shopping mall there aren't sidewalks normally but mm -hmm. so I, I'm not no, I, I, have I understand I personally understand. no issue with that but I think it's it is a change to the plan that we just need to be able to see it in its totality and if if the board decides it's minor I'm, I'm fine with that but we're talking about changing special permits we're talking about some other things here that so I just want to make sure we review and, it and I guess Tom's guidance says it pertains to the excavation and mining permit if uh, you know typically if a project's before the planning board is the planning board that issues that excavation and mining right. permit right. if it's not before the planning board then the building department or, or is it the zoning department issues that permit? Well, you, you know what the zoning? So I don't know that we couldn't take because they don't have a final number on the dirt yet, and it may be a while before they have a final number of dirt. I don't know if we could kind of pull that permit out from the planning board 
and just have them go to the zoning board when the time comes and they can have a public hearing specifically for that excavation and mining Why wouldn't the planning board just have that public hearing? Well, let's say they're not going to have a number for six well, months or what that final number is. Or, okay. or do it separately yeah. here for that particular. Yeah. Okay, fine. I, fine. I, I could I could get that number in a week, but I, I, I do think, uh, if we recall, uh, we did have a excavation in this particular location here, which was going to be that aggregate. So um, that is going to take away from some of the fill material that we had on site. So there may be, we got to go back and revisit the numbers okay. because there may be some additional volume that's being removed as a result of that, so that we may be closer than uh, what we're anticipating right now. Okay. So. so we would go back and I'll give you this information within, you know, I can show the location of the lighting if you want on the, I mean the signal pedestrian uh, uh, throughout the site and I can provide, come to the board with more detail if you want and then I can expedite this where you can get it in say two weeks or I could wait a month to do that whole. Based design. on the timing that you've expressed that you want to be able to try and open this site, yeah. this board right now meets monthly. We have the ability to schedule a second meeting in any given month. Okay. So I think you have one of two options. If it's going to take you three or four weeks to submit again, maybe we would look at holding the, the interim meeting that on the first, uh, first Tuesday of May um, to be able to go over it. Uh, otherwise, yeah, if you think you can submit it within two weeks, our next meeting is April 17th, and we could put you on again for discussion and maybe a final decision on any of the changes. I don't think we're going to have the crosswalk nailed down in two weeks or three weeks. Okay. So I'd, I'd push it off that month. But okay. well, maybe my, at that point, we can do Well, it. I don't have, we don't have to formally schedule anything right now because okay. this is it's not on for public hearing. It's on for discussion. So. Um, my, if we need to schedule the interim meeting, though, for the first Tuesday, Scott, of... Why do you need to have the crosswalk approved? So, Scott, if we need to, need to schedule the interim meeting for the first Tuesday of May, Pam, do we have sufficient time for notice if we wait to do that until April 17th, or would we need to do that now? We need 20 days. We need 20 days. So, realistically, I'm going to recommend that you ask us to have you come back on the first Tuesday of May, unless you're willing to wait until May 15th, which would give you roughly seven weeks, eight weeks. Let me, let me just ask this one question. So if we, if we made the plan changes and we gave the location of where these pedestrian signal at grade crossings are going to be located, the only problem is having an answer that it's going to be acceptable in that period of time. You can yeah. show them. We could show them, but what I'm discussion what I'm, purposes, I mean, we could do that much. That gives us some time yeah. before the next planning board meeting to further work out any specifics and whether or not this is a viable solution that we can bring to that planning board meeting if we went with the April, April meeting. And I think maybe at that point we would have run through all the changes if it's going to require any type of public hearing for the special permit mm -hmm. we'll understand that if we want to bifurcate it i'm fine but we can we get just, i want to make sure we have our ducks in a row because yeah. you're expressing a need to have a very tight timeline here Listen, we, and i think everybody in would probably like to see the site a little more uh finished yeah the people but, in back of me would yeah <laughs> just, just speak more about the crosswalk some of the details we talked about okay so the original plan was for a cattle crossing we were fine with that the town is absolutely fine with that they had some elevation issues they felt were, were difficult to, to overcome and they wanted to go with an overhead structure i think the, the overhead structure it has its share of challenges but in addition to that, the town board would have to approve an overhead pedestrian crossway, overhead pedestrian crossway over a town road, okay? And not and quite who would sure own that how. For maintenance. Exactly, maintenance okay. and okay. all that okay. stuff. So that's going to add a lot of time potentially to digest all that. We don't even have a design yet, okay? The at grade crossing is the simplest solution. And, you know, quite frankly, people are going to want to walk the shortest distance between point A and B, and that would be the shortest distance. So it does have that going for it. It's just a matter of between DOT and a traffic consultant and the equipment that's available to us if we can, if we can make that work. So it's going to take a little time. This only kind of came up last week as far as trying to change sure. to that once we heard that 
the cattle crossing wasn't going to work for them. And, and this crossing he, at this location, this crossing here, are already at grade crossings. All we would be doing is adding signalization to them. Trying to make them safer. Yeah. yeah. So, so there is a benefit by so, uh, by doing that. Absolutely. And is that a is that a pedestrian controlled signalization where you'd press the button and it's yeah. going to okay? Yeah. Okay. We're thinking something of possibly a cantilevered post structure right. with a yellow and red light or something. So as opposed to just flashing like we have here, we okay. want it to be actual red. And then again, maybe for large events, you turn those signals off well, and you're, you're going to have traffic control Well, we would use those, actually... but they also offer for large events or even on the weekends to have traffic control people in addition to okay. those lights. So okay. we're trying sense. to work through all those details. They're required okay. by the permit for that. But okay. again, if it, if it doesn't get approved, it brings us back to either that overhead crosswalk, which is, or, or them having to somehow build the uh, cattle cross. Cattle cross. Okay. So they can submit with the pedestrian, but just understand there's a lot of things we have to work through on that. Okay. I, I, you've got, there's enough detail here to understand the grading uh, associated with what the cattle crossing is intended to be. And what it would have to have is a sump pump for the drainage, anything that falls within there that would have to get pumped to a drainage structure. The other portion of that is something that would be reviewed by the building department, correct? Engineering and yeah. yeah. And then and then the other thing, I mean, hopefully we don't have to go to that, but the other concern again with that was doing that type of construction if there's if that road is open already to the public. Correct. That's a that's a lot of construction going on there in a tight space. We'd have to close the road for a period of time, so I mean, I, I think the at grade crossing, as long as we feel it can be signalized, true signalized, and it, it seems like the least invasive option um, and safe because you're going to have a light there and it's going to be far enough out back from 52 that you should have cars be able to recognize that next signal. So the other thing that we would do with that is we, we're incorporating a fence along this uh, line here so that all the pedestrians are... Uh, channelized to that pedestrian signalization right now there's and you're no going to have adequate sidewalks on both sides so that we don't have pedestrians walking in the roadway itself correct that way you don't have an individual walking here and then cutting across the access there okay so that's a um you understand our meetings and our timelines i guess you know if you i understand them <laughs> <laughs> soft copy soft copy Okay. You mean electronic copies? Electronic, yes. Okay. If we could, please. Anybody else? It's not that we don't enjoy paper, but there's some of us that can um, more easily work with it when it's electronic. Well, yeah, I was going to say, is there any, not just me, is there anybody yeah, who wants more paper? Of and more kind of Soft copy is much easier. Yeah. It, Everybody and it gets on the board distributed faster. Okay. There's definitely paper copies that you're going to need to have in the planning yeah. office because yeah. the public needs to be able to review right. anything you submit. I just don't submit. need as many, then. But, right. but for I'll us, we pre through. prefer the electronic copies that we yep. can review. Okay. Um, Scott, was there anything else you wanted to cover with the applicant tonight? I, I, the only, just real briefly, uh, the, what is, how do they refer to it? The community use agreement. We're right. still, I guess, trying to just We're finalize finalizing that. Yeah. That was another condition. Under for. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. For the domicile. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Great. Thank you for providing the update. It sounds like you've made some, um, definitely some progress here, and mm -hmm. the tweaks that you're making to the plan sound like they're making it a uh, more usable site, which is nice to hear. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you for you. your understanding and your support. Okay. Thank you. And if we need to schedule one of those interim meetings, um, just maybe Scott, if we can just give us the heads up and we can put it on for the 17th to schedule the. Okay. With regards to the cut fill analysis, uh, we're going to conduct that this week. We'll submit that on Monday or Tuesday. Uh, can I submit that via email or how do you? Just, I know you, that's something you can get sooner so you can look into whether Just or not. Make, please make sure it goes to Pam okay. so that she has it for the planning office. Okay, I can do a simple letter to that effect. All right. Thank you. Pam, do we, I'm sorry, just with regard to if we, if we needed to schedule a May uh, 1st meeting, would we need, we'd need to do that before April 17th? Do we need to make a motion at this meeting? No, you can do it on We April. can do it outside the meeting and then just as long as we advertise and schedule. Okay, very good. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, the next item on our agenda is the Copart site plan and special permit on Route 216. Am I pronouncing that correctly, Copart? Good evening. Uh, my name is Richard O'Rourke. I'm with the law firm of Keenan Bean as uh, serving as counsel to Copart. With me this evening is Tom Smith, who's with Copart, property manager. Uh, obviously, their offices are headquartered down in Dallas, Texas. Uh, also, Jeff Contelmo is here, a professional engineer from Insight Engineering, along with Kathleen Snyder, uh, a project landscape architect. Copart is contract vendee for uh, the property that has the address of 416 Route 216, but everybody knows it as the flea market and the airport property. Um, we, back in November and December, uh, submitted uh, our information to the board, and um, uh, rightfully so, you have an application processing law, and unfortunately, the property owner had not paid the taxes, so um, we couldn't see you for a while, but uh, Copart has stepped up to the plate uh, and made an arrangement with the property owner, and, and we're, we're here tonight to discuss our project. Um, this is a, a rather, um, shall we say, state-of-the-art kind of company. This is an online auction company. Uh, the, uh, the assets uh, are such that this is not something where a mass of people show up and there's an auction on site. Um, in fact, there are no operations on a weekend, very little. Uh, during the week, it's, it's an eight to five uh, uh, operation for the most part. Um, the organization works very closely with FEMA, uh, with first responders, uh, played an instrumental role after Hurricane Sandy. Um, and so the company is one that I think you have to understand what, what, the, what the process is. Uh, this is, is not, I've heard when we met with some officials, the first question is, well, this is a junkyard. Uh, it is not. And it is not because there's no stacking, there's no crushing, there's no dismantling, there's no selling of parts. Uh, the, uh, the, the vehicles are there for a period of 50 or 60 days. Uh, they are sold, they are picked up, the sales occur through the internet. Uh, obviously, we recognize that the, uh, the process is one that is foreign to, uh, to this particular area and one that I think uh, we would like to explain to you what Copart's about. Uh, Jeff can talk a little bit about the site. And um, as far as the use is concerned, we'd like to speak to you about that as well. So with that, if we could do that. Um, Just a couple of questions right Sure. Is, um, and you talked about the 50 to 60 days. Is there like some kind of a drop dead date, like after 120 days that stuff gets moved? Or is there like gradual residual? Yeah, you know that's a that's a, a good question. I'm sure Mr. Smith can answer it. Maybe maybe that question and many others will be answered once okay. we go through the whole thing. So he, Jeff's going to walk us through the business operations as well. Yeah, as well. and he'll okay. he'll be touching on it. This this is the information that uh, that Tom will be addressing. So sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Thanks. <laughs> I didn't mean to cut you off. No. We want to answer your question. Believe me. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. My name is Tom Smith. I'm with uh, Copart. I'm a property manager. I'd like to thank you for your time and your service to community tonight. Um, I've been with Copart for about 23 years. And I've traveled extensively through New England, northern Midwest, into St. Louis, through, uh, through the Carolinas and every state in between. I've been to <clears throat> many town halls. And I just want to compliment you on your decor. I appreciate the honoring your local heroes. I've never seen anything like that, so it's just want to say thanks. Um, I wanted to start basically with um, reading our statement of operations because perhaps some of the questions that you might have um, will be answered in that statement of operation, and um, it may spark some other questions that you may have. Uh, Copart, Inc. and its subsidiaries provide cutting-edge asset liquidation services to institutional, commercial, and private owners of used, undamaged, or damaged vehicles, trailers, watercraft, and power sports, industrial and commercial equipment, collectively assets. 
Most of our sellers are insurance companies, licensed dealers, financial institutions, charities, municipalities, and fleet operators. Copart Asset Service includes short-term storage and sale of assets and ancillary receiving, shipping, lien sale, and administrative services. All assets are liquidated intact, meaning no dismantling, draining of fluids, crushing, or sale of parts occurs at Copart facilities. A typical facility will consist of an office building, customer parking, a shipping and receiving area, short-term storage. After being received at a facility, assets are inspected, photographed, cataloged, <clears throat> excuse me, and placed in ground level, short-term storage designed for quick retrieval. Assets are never stacked and remain in short-term storage for an average of only 50 or 60 days. After being placed in short-term storage, assets are listed for sale through Copart's proprietary online auction style website, mobile apps, and mobile apps for purchase <clears throat> only by Copart registered members. Members are primarily licensed dealers, dismantlers, rebuilders, and exporters, and in some cases, end users. All offers, <coughs> excuse me, all offers are submitted and accepted electronically without the use of a live auctioneer. Members have provided the opportunity to inspect assets at a facility, although most asset inspections are limited to viewing images and information made available online. Members may electronically submit preliminary offers from anywhere in the world via personal computers, mobile devices, with internet access, or a limited number of computer kiosks located at our facilities. The high preliminary offer is carried over to the online virtual sale during which members may submit offers electronically only from a remote online device. Assets are sold to the member with the highest offer, <clears throat> who then arranges for pickup and transportation of their assets from a facility. Payments for sold assets may be made electronically via wire transfer or in person at the facility. Uh, titles to sold assets are either picked up by the buyer along with sold assets or mailed to Copart, uh, mailed by Copart to the buyer. That's a lot of, a lot of words, um, but I think it speaks to some of the concerns of the facilities. Um, we do deal with um, a primary uh, line of business is insurance company total loss vehicles. That can be anything from a theft, fire, collision. Um, you know, you guys may remember Hurricane Sandy. Um, I just had a, about an eight week deployment in uh, Houston from Hurricane Harvey. So we do process uh, um, vehicles from uh, uh, catastrophes as well. So uh, the primary driver, the primary source of our inventory is, is insurance company vehicles. Um, with the, uh, you know, I, I've been here 23 years, I'm a dinosaur. I have never bought anything online and it scares me. Um, when we moved from the live sale to the internet model, our business really took off and it began to grow and it began, <clears throat> excuse me, um, it, it gave buyers of our inventory the ability to uh, bid basically anywhere at any of our facilities in the country and now um, we are international as well. Um, so. It, it helped us out otherwise as well because we don't draw three, four hundred people to a facility for a live auction. You don't hear auction trucks or loudspeaker systems uh, announcing. There's no ring man yelling, hip, hip, you know. I don't know if you've ever been to a live auction, but it, it happens uh, very quietly. Um, we've got close to 200 facilities in the States and um, you know, with that number and only five days a week, you've got potentially 35, 40, 45 sales going on every day um, and there's no there's no noise associated with it um, so you know the, the the basic business model is based on those insurance company total loss vehicles but the computer doesn't really know what it's selling so we have the tool to market to uh, uh, lending institutions to uh, used car uh, franchise dealers um, to municipalities uh, um, various uh, large fleet uh, uh, situations at uh, Verizon, Bell Atlantic, anybody that has end of life fleet stuff that they want to get rid of. Um, so we're not the, um, we're not the uh, largest uh, auction company as far as um, what we would call whole cars, drivable cars. Um, that would be your Mannheims, your Odessas, but Copart is 
we feel the premier company for remarketing insurance company vehicles and um, a lot of uh, what you see there, the rental car companies, municipal fleets, charities, et cetera. Um, just a brief, uh, trade me, uh, switch me one slide, please. Uh, maybe it's the other way. Back one more, yeah. Um, just a little bit of history about the company. Uh, founded in 1982 by Willis Johnson. Willis was a, a Vietnam vet, uh, came home from uh, Vietnam, and he's really a true American success story. Uh, worked at a Safeco for probably six, eight months. <clears throat> Excuse me, went to community college for a couple of semesters and um, got into business for himself and basically built this company up uh, by his bootstraps. And uh, in 1994, the company went public. We are publicly traded uh, on the um, NASDAQ. Our symbol is CPRT. Um, you can see since I, <clears throat> excuse me, since I started working, we had uh, 40 locations in the United States. We're just completing number 41. And in my time here, we've gone to Canada, United Kingdom, <clears throat> Ireland, India, Brazil, Germany, uh, UAE, Oman, Bahrain, and Spain. And Spain. Uh, Germany as well, oh, Germany's on there. Um, and uh, we sell, uh, you see the searches there, we sell um, uh, in 200 locations worldwide. So without, um, I, I wanted to just read the statement of operations, give you a brief, a brief overview, and I think Jeff wanted to speak a little bit to the site plan. I'm, I, I'll answer questions, I'll address whatever uh, concerns that I may, but I didn't want to interrupt if you want to uh, give Jeff a chance to speak to the site plan or if. But before you do that, if you yeah. could, just I understand what you read to us. Okay. I've, I've read it. Um, I think it was in your application package. Um, what I what I don't see here, or what I just didn't maybe glean from your application package was, are you when you say you're you're having 30 to 40 auctions a day, or 30 to 40 auctions going on at any given time, um, are you selling cars one by one, or are you selling like lots of groups of cars? What what does that look like exactly? So when you say it, people enter bids and the lowest highest bid is carried over to an online a, a auction, typical just, just a, walk me through what that looks like, if you don't mind. A typical facility such as this one, um, you know, is uh, going to pick up inventory throughout the week, um, 30, 40 cars a day. That inventory is going to build up during the time that it's building up. We're taking the title work, whether there's a, a bank lien or whether who, who, if the owner has the title, if the bank has a title, insurance company has a title, we're going to process title work and get a salvage certificate generally from the state. As soon as we have that certificate, we put it in the next available sale. Typically, the sales at an individual facility will occur weekly. Okay. So when I said, uh, and, and we are selling individual cars one at a time. That's not, uh, you know, nobody's bidding on 50 or 60 at a time. Okay. Um, the, the website is fairly unique. The technology is fairly unique because it is a live auction um, where as each unit comes up for sale, uh, you will see, and, and I, I get lost on that website because it's fun to watch, but um, you will see where each buyer is registering from. So, you know, a, a, a 98 Ford Taurus may have six people bidding on it actively, and the computer prompts you when bidding slows down, you get a computerized voice on your laptop that says, going once, going twice. Uh, if somebody jumps in and bids again, it, it, it registers that bid and it starts over again. Um, we do have a similar function to might be like an eBay where you can buy it here kind of deal. Um, but, the, but, but the vehicle that really makes it successful is that live component. Not very many uh, websites have that live auction component to them. Um, so it's each individual uh, sale. So if you think in terms of picking up 50 cars a day <clears throat> and you're going to have a sale weekly, in order to kind of keep your inventory even, you're going to sell 250, 300 cars a week. Uh, title work uh, comes back from the state and um, you, you like to try to uh, sell at least what you're bringing in. Um, 
so that when that sale happens, uh, 250, 300 units, whatever it may be, it, it rolls through. It's usually minutes uh, for a car to sell, maybe even less than that. So it may take a couple of hours to go Can through I a whole sale. Ask, are these yep. reserve auctions or no reserve auctions? When you say reserve, you mean no put reserve. a put a, a minimum bid on? Is there a minimum, on? A minimum set by uh, Well, uh, that would depend on who the seller is. Sometimes they put reserves, sometimes oh, so you they don't. don't. Control it, that's whoever to sell it. Might put it yeah, we don't take ownership of the vehicles. We're selling them at their direction. So right. depending on what <clears throat> type of contract we may have with the particular customer, they'll kind of dictate to us what 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 they what they want to do with that's that. That's the Mike's point. Piece. If there's an unrealistic minimum bid, that it could lead to a car sitting around for a while. Well, right? and and to that. Um, Everything sells, and there are times when people put uh, unrealistic expectations on what something's worth, um, and they will generally see within a matter, and we, we can enter in the next available sale. Right. So in a matter of two or three weeks, you'll start seeing a trend. If you're trending down, they'll probably let it go. If you're trending up, then they might say, well, run it one more time, that kind of deal. Um, so. Those decisions are not up to us. We very seldom make those. Uh, there are customers that just, and, and the lion's share of the, of the cars go. You reach they don't a point have, where if they're just not realistic, you say take your car back? Our general managers watch those auctions very carefully. And we also have, uh, because we sell so many cars, we've been doing this almost 30 years. And, and with the, the advent, not the advent, with, with, uh, as the computers take a bigger role, it's easier to keep data on that. So we can, we, we can predict pretty well whether someone's expectations are real or not. And that's where our general managers get involved and you know, this isn't, this isn't happening. A 98 Ford Taurus isn't gonna get you $5,000. I'm, I'm sorry, I'd be lucky to get 500. Um, um, so are these, these are the, it says servicing these organization types. Are these the members? I mean, are these groups trading cars amongst themselves, or are there members that are? Oh no, no, no. Um, and that these are the sources of the cars. The sources of the cars would be your insurance companies, dealerships, charities, etc. The buyers are generally rebuilt. And, and what am I? Just okay. So. The, like the members, are there any like individual members? Members are people who, just who can buy, bid. Me right? Members are, you know. Uh, people who can bid. Uh, right, but I mean, uh, yeah, we, what, what depending on what your people? state requirements would be, would kind of dictate what we can do with our membership. And I don't particularly know what's, what the rules are in New York, but certain states, I know one, in, uh, for example, North Carolina, the public can buy salvage. You could actually come in and buy salvage. Um, but you have to register. You have to be a registered copart buyer. You can't just walk off the street. So um, right. you can uh, register online. Um, but typically, the lion's share of these uh, vehicles are going to go to your auto, auto wreckers, you know, the, the junkyards. Yeah. We're, we're the source of a lot of their inventory. That just raised a question to me. Suppose somebody comes in and bids, you know, $8,000 on a Lincoln Continental, and the, you, the accept, you yeah. accept a bit. The thing's been banged up a little bit. Uh, and the guy comes, and what he decides is all he wants is the bumper. What do you do? He's taking the whole car. <laughs> okay, I just yeah, we're, sure. we're not, we're not doing any will parting. will not allow him to dismantle. No, 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 no. Which no. brings no. me to my next question, is a beautiful lead-in, is what's the average unit sale size is it really individual cars going so because this this is going to play to a key point that i think is going to be part of the public's discussion sure. and that is the size of the trucks coming in and off and that's not a reflection on on this use but it's more a reflection on the roads leading in there i'm sure, sure you guys have taken a look at that and said yeah i was going to say depending on the route that they take from 52 to 216 that could be really ugly going through the village of stormville uh, you're going to have a lot of upset people. But if you go down 52 and try and make the right on the 216 that way, it's it's an impossible turn for a large truck to make. So I, I really don't know how you're going to get there and then navigate the couple of bad turns on 216, uh, you know, yeah. thinking in particular Phillips Road, down by Brothers Road. Uh, if there's big trucks going through there, that's going to be a problem. Let, let's... Um Let's make sure we bring that up when Jeff's presenting for the site plan itself, because I agree with you. I think there's 
probably traffic concerns we need to sort of outline for you and then see where you're going with it. But could we just come back to my question, which was, what does this look like? So, so far what I've learned from you is that you're going to buy cars during the week. You're going to, they're, they're going to come into your site. Sorry, they're going to come into your site for auction. You're going to try to get the salvage title. That's going to take some period of time. As soon as you have the salvage title, you're scheduling them for some type of auction. Where does the description in here come in where you allow people to make pre-bids before the auction happens? How does that part work? That because you make a reference here to having customers coming into kiosks at your site. So if, uh, and, and it's very infrequent, but we have two or three different kiosks that we'll put for the, for, uh, th there are gentlemen like myself that don't want to buy something on a phone app. And, and I, I don't want to say that everybody that buys from us is, is a man either, um, but there are people that simply don't want to do this from their office computer. They may come into our facility and sit down at one of our terminals and just enter. Uh, their, they're, they're essentially entering a maximum bid at that point. They're not actively bidding. So they're not actually bidding. there for the live auction. No, they're there no, before they're coming live in and they're entering in what they would call their, their maximum uh, bid. Okay, so how so. much time before the actual auction happens and the ability to enter these bids that you're talking about, what, what is the timeline for that? Just There's so I, a, I'm trying to understand, you're saying 50 to 60 days for a car. I'm just trying to understand okay. what, um, what that looks like. When you get the title work back from the um, state, it gets entered into our computer system and the sales are going to happen weekly. And let's just say it's on Wednesday. When they enter that car into the sale, they may not want to put it into that very first sale. Say you get the title work back on a Tuesday, you don't want to put it in Wednesday sale because nobody will really have a chance to view it. So you may enter that in the following week or the week after. So you're going to have about a one or two week time frame there where when, when you go onto our website, you're going to be able to look at the next, the very next sale and a couple upcoming. of okay. upcoming, yes. And those are those opportunities where you can go in before that sale happens and place uh, that bid. Are, are you allowing those consumers to walk your site or do they have to just look at a computer screen? Um, we have found, yes, they can come in and view inventory. Um, you meaning walk your site? Well, they're gonna walk the site in a, uh, in a designated area that has sales cars in it. They're not going to walk the entire property. But that's what I mean. But they can come and physically look at the car. Sure. You're not just yes. letting them come in and work at a terminal. You're going to allow no, them to see they can go it look if they at a car. If they want to, yeah, we'll generally escort them out and, and, okay. uh, and let them view that. And, but what we're seeing and what the trend is, is this, this the, you know, the business is so sophisticated um, and it really is a testament to what, you know, the computers allow you to do. Uh, these guys that buy this inventory, they know what they're going to pay for a car and they really look at the pictures and just buy. I never thought it would happen. And when one of our executives says, hey, you know, we're toying around with this internet thing and we got this little website. And you remember when everybody's website first came out, they were just a page. They didn't do anything. You couldn't click on anything. Um, oh, that'll never work. People will, I, I want to touch things that I buy. I want to feel them. I want to Tire, tire kicker. I never thought that the, yeah. that the industry would get to the point where people are just looking at pictures right. and I'll, I'll take it. Okay. All right. So now let's say that we've had the one or two weeks where you've collected pre-bids. So you've established either a minimum value from the seller or from the minimum highest bid that you received. It goes into the auction. What's the timeline from the point where that auction ends and the car is sold? Couple what does that look couple like? Couple of hours. I mean, from, say this one more time. So I'm trying to understand the car enters your site and the car leaves your site. So after the auction, the car is sold. How much time are you giving From the time it's sold, uh, I believe uh, buyers have three days to pick that car up before we would institute a storage policy. And you have, you, you know, we'll allow folks to have a grace period to get there and pick it up because they have to arrange transport okay. on, on a truck. Um, Even but if, if it's drivable, you're not letting them drive it. They must, or they're salvage Well, titles, they, so they if they come in and it's drivable okay. and they can slip a dealer plate on it and they want to drive it out, they they're certainly allowed to. Um, even with it, okay, even with a salvage title, they can do that. Sure. Okay. Well, you fill it back up with fluids, though. I thought the fluids were drained. When they well, if the side. car is drivable, it's probably not. Uh, it's probably not been in too bad of an accident. We're not filling anything up with fluids. 
Okay. Uh, um, Some of your natural disasters, you may just have them. They may just have been wet or something like that. I mean, you've you well, sometimes, yeah, uh, it's not necessarily you know, damage, some of the right? the variety of the, the spectrum is very large on what you what, what an insurance company will total. And if a car sits in a dealership and, it, and water comes up uh, to the rocker panels, the car is probably not damaged too bad, but they're not going to sell it for new. That doesn't mean you can't drive it off of the lot. Uh, but but to speak to your point, after the sale, you have about, I think it's three days free of storage. And, and the reason that we institute a storage policy after that is guys in this I'm sorry in the car business you know they're, they're they move these cars they may be buying it to resell it and if they don't have a buyer they'll let it set at our place and if we don't incentivize them to get it out uh, they'll they'll use us for their storage lot so we, we have to we have to put uh, but you've built that in you have fees or whatever you charge them yes. if they don't pick it up in a certain amount of time yes and and then, you know, sometimes there are instances where people, um, and, and we don't like to do this because you don't want to, people to say they're going to buy it. Uh, when, when it's sold via our computer system, a check gets cut and it goes to the seller. We, we do that. If we don't collect on the other side, we're, we're left holding the bag. So we don't like to let people out of the sale, but certainly if there's extenuating circumstance, they get out of the sale. They don't come and pick it up. Then we put it, you know, it, it sells in the in the next sale. Okay. Okay. That that fifty or sixty days is, and in, in you'd ask the question. Um, there are uh, certain cases where vehicles get abandoned and uh, they get in litigation. They're a very small percentage of those cards are not going to sit on our facility until there's a, a, a tree growing up through them or anything of that nature. Okay. Okay. Um, and then, is this the, the facility you're proposing <clears throat> here? Is this comparable to the average size facilities you have in other locations, or is it smaller, larger? It's um, it, it's it's on the uh, probably the upper third of the spectrum. If you were going to divide everything in, into threes, this would probably be on on the larger third of the spectrum. Okay. Um, this is comparable to the size of the facility that we have in uh, Brookhaven. Um, smaller than Albany, uh, smaller than, and, and, you know, just to speak to what, what facilities we have in the state of New York, we have one in uh, Brookhaven, Long Island. We have one in the town of Colony uh, off of, um, is, it, uh, is it US 5 or 5 or 15 or something? It runs from uh, Albany to Schenectady. Um, okay. We have one in uh, Brewerton, which is north of Syracuse. We have one in uh, Leroy. And I uh, feel like I'm forgetting one. Newburgh. Uh, Newburgh, yeah. yeah. Um, so that would be, that's all of them in New York. Okay. What's it, what's it compared to this one in Newburgh? Because that's the one that we've seen. Um, this one's about probably two and a half, three times the, the, the physical footprint. Is it the same nature in Newburgh? Same, I'm sorry. same model? Yeah. Just bringing them in, selling them, not yeah. dismantling yeah. or anything. Could I just ask, uh, do they come in in bulk? I mean, multiple cars in a carrier, and how do they leave the site individually or um, bulk? Most of the, most, from our standpoint, in order for us to be efficient, we have to try to bring them in in groups. So, and, and to haul uh, most of these cars, they have to be on a flatbed or they have to be on a hook. So we're going to want to do that on a on a two car or four car um, to try to get some economies out of the out of the towing service. And when they leave, it's the same thing. The guys don't want to pay if if a guy buys uh, four or five cars, he doesn't want to pay four or five different tow companies. He wants to try to find. Would that be the average that most of your members buy multiple vehicles on the auctions? Or? Yeah, and and most of them uh, have their own ve have their own vehicles, and they may have a two car, they may have their own four car to come pick up their own inventory. Uh, we do get some uh, trucks that uh, you know they'll sub haul for other other folks, but it's it's generally not uh, you know if you're going to get uh, 50 cars in a day or 40 cars in a day, you're not going to see 50 individual trucks coming in, usually in groups of two and four. Okay, this was helpful. Thank you. For walking us through that. Well, thank you. Oh, you have another question? I'm sorry. Go uh, ahead, Mike. Yeah, the, uh, the international sales, 
it says you know like a quarter of them are going overseas is that like one standard point that you're heading to like we can expect traffic between here and like Bayonne or one of the places you know a port um, <coughs> let me just have you come back to the mic I'm sorry we, we record the meetings you know that's a little bit above my pay grade. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm not. Uh, okay. You have so many uh, locations on the East Coast here uh, with ports, and I'm from Pittsburgh, and we don't have <laughs> ports. Okay. So it's not um, like you know twenty. No, it's not going, going all following the same, the same route. No. Okay. No. Thank you. It's Scott, and your Newburgh facility is going to stay operational. You're not. No, I, I don't. We're going to what. <coughs> What, what um, uh, will more than likely happen to, to kickstart this facility? It would probably take forty or fifty percent of the business that's going on in Newburgh, and probably certainly everything that's happening east of the Hudson River, mm -hmm. and then in um, uh, what would I call that? Western Connecticut, because our next facility from Newburgh going that way is in uh, 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 Hartford. So okay. we've got this area yeah. here where okay. we're trying to put that spot on the map to, to take some relief off of uh, Hartford and relief off of Newburgh. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. Jeff Cantelmo from Insight Engineering, Surveying, and Landscape Architecture. Uh, Kathleen Snyder's over there working the computer. She's our project landscape architect. And uh, we've, we've prepared and submitted a concept plan and we realize that it's fairly basic, but um, we want to give the flavor of um, how uh, Copart's proposal here would fit onto the Stormville Airport property. And I know that the board is fairly familiar with the property and um, its history and what's been happening there for the last couple decades anyway in terms of the flea markets and shows. Um, the, the proposal, as I said, is fairly basic. Um, the the active part of the facility which is shown up on 216 is comprised of a 14,400 square foot building which would be uh, the building where um, 30 plus employees would uh, be sited um, they, that would include uh, the office people the processing uh, of, of the photographs and online registry of the cars as well as customer service uh, the, in, in front of that is a 90 car parking lot which would be similar to any parking lot for a commercial facility it would have a pertinent landscaping uh, around it it would have lighting uh, for those times of the years that uh, we leave work and it's dark outside um, and it would be a new entry drive established off of new york state route 216 uh, the other driveways, there's, I think there's a half a dozen driveways now, uh, would be eliminated. Uh, we m may want to add one back in based on comments we got from the Fire Advisory Board. But that would be a single point of entry for the employees and any of the customers. Um, off to the west of the building parking area is what they call the bullpen or pickup drop-off area. And that's exactly what it's for. It's for the area where someone would either drop off an asset of a vehicle or pick one up. Um, so, so that's really what's considered to be the active or commercial portion of the property. The remainder of the property really um, is a entirely fenced in secure area without any lighting, uh, with security cameras, with a gravel surface where the assets or vehicles would be stored. Um, uh, Kat, Kat, so, if we so could. So, I'm sorry, I thought you said you have give or take 350 cars on site, you're going to fence in the entire property? Well, we're going to fence in the portion of the property that would be that would be for storage. And uh, the, the, what you just outlined as you were talking. Uh, correct. Kathleen was going around. It looks yeah. like everything outside the wetland buffer. Well, it, it's primarily what's what's already disturbed and or developed. And, and we actually have it. Uh, could you go to the next image, please? So so this is an aerial photo which kind of keys in uh, the fenced area and the limits of the storage. And as you can see, um, the areas which have been cleared are in active use, either by the flea market airport or past agricultural 
I would say, activities. Right. And um, what we've but, done. But that's a much larger area than what would be indicated by the size of facility you described. And the car counts that in we've your seen. application. Yeah, I think I think uh, Tom can can, can clarify that. It's not okay. all going to be covered with cars. It, it could. Okay. Do you want time to talk to that? If you don't mind, do you, could you just answer that question? Because it sounds different uh, the, than what you described. I'm yeah, sorry, I Jeff, I don't mean to I interrupt you. I didn't mean you. to say that there would only be 350 cars. I'm just giving you a typical example. If you're picking up 50 cars a day, you're going to end up with 250 cars at the end of the week. Okay, so now you have that time lag in there where it takes you 50 to 60 days to move that car out. Your inventory continues to build. And even if I multiply right. that by 10 you, weeks, that's still only 2,500 cars. You're fencing in about 100 acres. Well, it's more like 75. Okay, you're fencing in 75 acres. <clears throat> and the, uh, the one element that um, we expect this facility to do is um, support us in, and I, I just wrote on my piece of paper that I forgot to mention this. Okay. To support us in our uh, catastrophe response. In your, oh, catastrophe response. Okay, so sorry, we, got it. we do not expect to move in and fill that site up completely with cars. We expect there to build an inventory, and what that is, it may be 40 acres, it may be 50 acres. We expect there to be extra space available that we want to develop because what we're finding out is we're having these catastrophes in different areas every five or six or seven years, and, we're, and we've been not equipped to handle the, the increased storage. Um, and for an example, in, in Houston, um, we ended up leasing uh, a couple of hundred acres to process the salvage that came out of that storm. Um, we didn't have it. So we're going out, we rented some, uh, um, uh, an NHRA drag strip that had a 150 acre parking lot. And we put uh, flood cars on it. Um, part of the part of our business is when the insurance companies call you can't say no so we have to be able to handle that um, I have been involved in Katrina I've been involved in Sandy Harvey Irma Matthew and uh, I used to have hair and it wasn't gray <laughs> um, we have been um, over the years refining what we do in our response to these catastrophes and trying to build a little bit of capacity into our system and uh, th this is this plays into that okay. uh, model a little bit um, okay. Okeechobee Florida we bought a property because it was available and because it, it helps us out strategically in Florida okay. in Houston we bought 250 acres and closed on it uh, about two weeks before Harvey hit so it was 250 acres of undeveloped land sitting there. It was absolutely useless to us for that storm, but we do anticipate, you know, a need uh, as, 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 you know, we see these storms just every five, six, seven years, uh, us needing a capacity. So part of that's factored into this facility. But we would intend to fence the entire property, develop it into a, a gravel storage lot. And I, honestly, I would say, you know, anticipate half of it within two or three years, it would be full. And then the, the balance of the property available for cat response. And a full estimate of the number of cars on site? Mm -hmm. yeah. For half of it? or for the, We, we, no, we, we store, uh, I think, about 135, 140 cars an acre. So uh, it... Uh, uh, whatever that is times the maximum capacity. 100 would, would be 4,000 on 40 acres. So it seems like either they're there for more than 50 to 60 days or you're processing more than 250 a week on average. Well, we, well, I, I, what I'm being told is that the right now Marlboro processes 100 cars a day and this is gonna take half of their inventory. Okay. So I'm saying 50 cars a day. You know, that's going to give us the ability. That's to before you ramp up and, and have its own business generated. 
Well, we expect that, well, you, you have some organic growth just because of population increases, but we would also have the ability to, to, to get additional business. Okay. But I, I, don't, uh, I don't anticipate this growing into a 100-acre facility in, you know, two, three years. Given that this is, these cars are all in a, in a database, is there any way to run a quick algorithm that says, here's, you know, just take like the Hartford and the Newburgh and say, here's what the bell curve looks like in terms of the number of days those cars have been on site? It's got to be in the system, right? It's all computerized. It's a calculation. I, I can't answer that. I'm sure. I'm. I'm sure we could get that available for you if that's what you need. Well, I, I get the feeling. That, you know, we want to know, and I. And I think when we have a public hearing, I think people are going to want to know that. And the well, you I know, mean, you're, you're stating that you're stating that the cars don't stay there for very long. That even if they've been in an accident, they're not leaking. The longer a car stays on your lot, the higher the chance that something's going to degrade or give way or whatever. So sure. the numbers you're giving us and the acreage you're setting aside here aren't matching up yet. So we just need to understand that a little better. Are you going to be processing more per day? Ramp right. it up over time. Just, just, and you don't have to do it right now, yep. but just sure. we need the explanation of that. What's the maximum capacity? How do you expect to use that maximum capacity? What's that going to look like? It's also going to lead into, Ed, what you were saying with the traffic and routes and things like that, what we can expect to see is increased truck traffic and um, you know, vehicle traffic on, on the roads. Okay. And that's just maybe better to come back to us with that than, than kind of estimate. And by the way, I, I, you know, first of all, welcome. It's always great to have new businesses coming into town, but you know, we're trying to give you the, the, the worst case scenario right. right up front. Here you right. go. You know, right. so. No, I, I made the call in the parking lot of the hotel that I was staying in to try to get a handle on what, what the volume is going to be here because the, the facility is large and, and we want to develop the whole property. Okay. And, and, we, and I was told that the intent is to have this uh, fudge factor, if you will, built into our system so that we have capacity for storms. But however, it will function primarily initially based off of 50% of the inventory that's happening in Marlboro. So what we so, would want to understand is the expected um, averages daily, not for the catastrophic event, but for just when it's up and running the way you think it will. We understand there's going to be a ramp up time, so don't tell us what it's going to look like in the first month. But let's say five years in, what is your average eight week time period look sure. like? How many cars are coming in? Presumably the same number of cars are leaving because you have a 50 to 60 day window. It just, just yes. If we can understand that, that just helps us again with traffic estimates and things like that a little bit better. We get what you're saying. You're going to do two, two or four, two to four at a time, that sort of thing. It just we need to be able to estimate those things. Okay, I just cool. had a couple questions for the gentleman. Um, the parking, and maybe Jeff, I don't know if you want to speak to it, but I think how many employees again? Thirty. Thirty, and I think there's some like 92 parking spaces. Yeah. Well, that's what made me. That's what made me write the note over here. That that's taken into account that we're going to need some extra parking in the event of a catastrophe. No, I'm talking about employee parking spaces. Yeah. So bring when, more when, staff on. Is that the idea? When yeah, because you're going to have a increase in volume. We have cat teams. I mean, we have. Uh, yeah, but I don't. I, I don't know if we want to have uh, uh, an impervious paved parking lot just because you need it every five years. I mean, there might be other ways to uh, Yeah, we haven't that. gotten that far yet, but okay. yeah, I agree with you. Well, I guess my question is, probably if all the same question, 90 parking spaces for 40 employees, like, employees didn't. Is it strictly for employees, or when you do have auctions, do you go around like the old way, where a group of 20 people would follow the auctioneer around from car to car, and that's why you need the additional parking spaces for those? For those. No, that's not happening. The, the sales are on the, on the internet. Strictly on the internet. Yeah. There's no walking around a site with the phone and no no no, okay. no. and then uh, in, in addition to employees during those times uh, you have uh, insurance company representatives uh, adjusters that'll come to the sale so to have a, a little bit of an oversized parking okay. lot um, we, we feel is uh, uh, necessary a little bit's like double or more but that's why I asked the question okay okay thank you Thank you, Jeff. I'm sorry to yep. take that sure, detour, no but it just, help, it just um, helps yeah, us it, help frame what we're going to look for from sure. you for some of the site plans. Um, warming up the audience. <laughs> no problem. Um, yeah, Tom, Tom pointed out that there's employees that park there. There's some customer parking set aside there and some client parking, which, as he said, are, are their clients. Um, 
on the other end, but we can get we can clarify what the steady state number is and understand what the overflow is, and that that's a good idea looking forward. Um, just to continue on the site itself, um, it's a 151 acre site, and as Tom said, uh, the fenced in area there represents, I think, in round numbers, 80 acres. So, um, and as you can see, what we've attempted to do is uh, stay out of the wetland buffer, certainly, and um, work in most cases within the areas that have already been disturbed. Uh, we have allocated significant area for stormwater management uh, with six uh, stormwater basins uh, sited in the, the areas where uh, the main portion of the property would drain to. And um, we have provided uh, just some preliminary ideas and some screening that may take place along the frontage on 216. Um, in addition to uh, the concept, conceptual site plan that we submitted, uh, we did submit a fully AF uh, just based on some of the preliminary information uh, that will have to be advanced with some further detail. I was going to uh, say, didn't, you had a few things you noted, though, that weren't submitted yet. Correct, so. right, because of the early stage. But we did want to at least get that document in your hand to, to give a, the breadth of, of uh, information uh, but that we did have in hand. Um, in addition, and in support of that EAF, we submitted a preliminary traffic uh, report that was prepared by one of our team members, Kim Lee Horn, um, who actually took some counts at the Brookhaven facility, which is actually slightly larger than this one, if I remember correctly, and um, actually took some counts and gave some statistics in terms of what the anticipated traffic would be and a breakdown of cars versus trucks versus even tractor trailer car carriers and again uh, we're going to get into that a so bunch that more not just employees that was deliveries correct as well because I, I was I, I, I thought one of the numbers of arrivals was 37 which kind of smells like the employee base yeah, again, uh, they, they were working during some very specific time frames with peaking, and that very well could be. Um, Kim Horn couldn't be here tonight, but the idea uh, by having them engaged and on the team is that they can work with your traffic consultant and answer the questions relative to traffic. I, I, I'm, I, I kind of play traffic engineer on TV, but I'm not really one. So. No, that's fair. Um, and I apologize, I'm, I'm just looking at it. I didn't get a chance to read through the traffic report okay. in detail, but um, if it's not in here, one of the things that would be very helpful to us is to understand the difference in the two facilities. So give us a, like the size of the office, the number of employees, the number of cars, so that we can compare it to what we have here. And it's sure. just will help us relate it. And you may it may already be in here. I, I didn't get a chance um, to read through this in detail yet. Okay. Are there any other questions on the site? If not, I'm going to hand it over to Rick. Okay. Uh, did you want to talk more about the actual paths? And you, you were bringing up the, well, the routes in. And yeah, that was that was uh, certainly you know in your uh, thing here. It says you're going to take Ludingtonville Road down Stormville Mountain the, on 52. And then I'm unclear as to how you're going to get to 216 from there. Yeah, the the, uh, the distribution will be discussed in more detail by the traffic engineer. I mean, I, I travel that route, and uh, I think you said it earlier. If, if someone is coming from the east and gets off at exit 17, the route would be 52 to Old Route 52 to 216. Yeah, and that yeah, that takes you right through Stormville. And, right. Uh, um, depending on the number of trucks and uh, how big they are and how noisy there are, uh, that could certainly be some concerns that uh, might need to be addressed. Is a town road. And that's yeah, a small road. Yeah, I was going to say Yeah, it's a small a road. road. Uh, Coming from yeah. the west would mean basically you'd have to get off at Limekiln. Right. You if, if, you came, if you came from, from the, the, I'm going to say the south, the southwest or, or west, yes. Um, you know, also, the, the traffic report also talks about Route 55, 55 and coming in from Route 55 on 216. So again, you know, the draft traffic distribution uh, can be refined within that study, which is which is a, a normal course of action, and discuss that some more. Um, well, the, the we, other the other problem with either one of those routes from either direction is, is the the bad turns on mm -hmm. 216, right. uh, you know, <laughs> either between. 52 in the and the airport or going old 52 and going up there, there there's some bad or even from 55 out by mm -hmm. depot hill there's 
still very bad turns that they're you know people take too fast now so um you know if, if you've got any good sized truck that's going to be a problem we, again, we'll we'll address we'll address those routes. I, I would, we're talking I would trucks echo what you're saying. I, I think typically with your Not traffic two. analysis, you you tend to give us you know Eight peak cars. hours, and I and I understand why you do that, assessing for traffic lights and things like that. But I okay. I think just That's understanding right. total per day in and out is going to be important for this project as well. Yeah, Even the if the, the traffic autos, counts. And I'd also like to know whether you're running a 24-hour operation or whether you're running during norm, normal you business know. hours, that sort of thing. Because again, trucks can be a little bit noisy. You've got uh, the, the routes you're describing are very close to residential areas in the town. The, so. the, the counts do take into account daily traffic and peak traffic typically, and, okay. and the numbers that are in our report do talk about that. Okay. Um, I think Tom, again, made, I Tom made it clear. To read through it yet. No problem. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll refine everything and we'll talk about it in much more detail, I'm sure. But I just want to hit a couple high points, and they are that number one, yes, daily traffic numbers are in there. Uh, number two, Tom stated that the, op the, the hours of operation for Copart are normal business day, 8 to 5 o'clock. There are no off hours uh, activities that take place except during a catastrophe, and they do have that exception and that's uh, fair. stated. That, that's fair. Um, and, then, and then about the, the road geometry, I mean, I, I'm very familiar with the road geometry. Um, I know that the state the state controls much of, uh, of the network we've talked about. Um, we also know that trucks travel those routes right now. As Tom indicated, uh, the trucks he's talked about, the ones and twos are not tractor trailers, but you know, flatbed trucks um, that aren't the biggest trucks that travel those routes. But we certainly uh, will take a look at them in the context of uh, the existing conditions and the current or planned improvements that, that may take place. And um, I'll leave that to Kim Lee Horn. That's what they're on our team. I do think the one message that probably you should tell them is, Oh, I think old Route 52 would be off the table as a town road, residential road. I think that one's off the table. So whatever you study, you got to omit that. Since you're familiar with the geometry, you know it's a sine wave. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which which is a sine wave? The the the, uh, the route of the road? Yeah. I know yeah. What you're it's a little more arbitrary than a sine wave, actually. So Jeff, I'm sorry, Jeff, stay, stay with us for one more minute. Um, so I just want to make sure that you know, if you haven't received copies, you will shortly. Um, we have Fire Advisory Board, Conservation Advisory Council yep. notes. Michelle has, has provided a memo, as has Morris. We have not gotten either of those. Okay, so we'll just, we'll make sure you get all of our initial We comments. did get Dutchess County planning also. You're pointing. Mm -hmm. Okay. She's got, she's got that. Oh, okay. <laughs> I couldn't tell what you were pointing at. Um, and, and yes, our, our Dutchess you County, oh. our Dutchess County did respond and say they needed yes. more information, yep. but they also expressed some initial concerns and, and considerations. So just, Understood. I want to make sure you have all of those things as you're looking to build out the plan a little more fully. Thank you. Um, we do. The only one we don't have is the Morris uh, one that you mentioned. So. Okay. We'll make sure that you get copies Thank you. of everything. Yep. Thank you. The, um, I think you have a, a feeling for what the use is. And I think the one thing that, uh, that's so important and, and everything that's been said about truck traffic is absolutely true. But when I look at your zoning ordinance, I look at your, your, your uses uh, in this particular zone, what we're looking at is a lot of truck traffic in terms of whether it has to do with manufacturing or it has to do with um, uh, cold storage plants, creameries, ice cream factories, bottling works, baking plants, food and drink distribution plants. We're talking about major truck traffic, and that is just one of many of the uses that are permitted in this particular zone. So whatever the issue is in terms of truck traffic, it's something that I think that the board's going to have the same questions, whether it was disuse or one of those other uses it's the as same as long as you realize we're asking appropriate questions uh, you're asking that. very appropriate questions absolutely I and but I, I think the, the key point here and, and where we are as I mentioned up front there is not a full application we know that uh, we, we submitted essentially a concept plan try to give you enough information so that you got a sense of what this is about we're contract vendees one of the one of the threshold issues here is whether we are a use that is permissible within within the zone if you if you read what I wrote 
to you uh, in that regard, and it's something that we looked at very, very carefully. One of the uses that is permitted in this particular zone reads as follows, and again, with the overlay of the truck traffic and everything else we've talked about, it says, any use of the same general character as a listed permitted use provided that the board shall find that said use is not inconsistent with the generally accepted definition term of light industry, and that gets us into that whole issue of the trucking and everything else, and where in the estimation of the board, the enterprise in question will be beneficial to the town as a whole. You don't need to know about tax rateables. You, we know how much the taxes are without this property being developed, so, which we paid to get here, uh, just, to, just to get here by way of the application. If we improve this property, I have a feeling that our tax rateable will go up. Put that aside for the moment. When we take a look at uses that are consistent, and this is a 21st century company, so you're, it's not contemplated in your use table per se. However, when I take a look at the uses that you have and we take into consideration the truck traffic and the other kinds of things that are, uh, that are permissible within the zone, we're not that far off. And then when you take a look at some of the more particular uses, quite frankly, I think they're very analogous. And a perfect illustration is, is the, the use that is permitted in this zone, which includes contractor equipment storage yards, building materials sales yards, and lumber yards. Merchandise in, merchandise out. Big trucks in, big trucks out. Small, we have small trucks in, small trucks out. So I guess, you know, my, my, my initial threshold inclination, and we would be delighted to furnish all of that information, but uh, by virtue of what it says in terms of what the board makes a determination that uh, is our use consistent with some of those others, I would respectfully argue that it is, particularly when you take a look at your uses that are permitted, you take a look at the characteristics of those uses, and you take a look at contractor's yards or lumber yards or things of that nature. You have fungible materials coming in, fungible materials going out. We have probably less traffic than many of the other uses that are permissible in this zone. So again, I guess that's our position. Um, and, and frankly and respectfully, we, we've got to get a sense of whether, should we go forward with this or should we not? And that's an issue that I pose to the board. I'm sure you're going to want to speak with counsel and your consultants about it, but I, I need to know because otherwise, you know, I'll say a few we're things. off to a we're off to a an odyssey, and I've I've been I had I did not have gray hair when I started doing this 30 years ago. So, so I'll say a few things. Um, I understand the area of the code that you're referencing, where it says other similar uses. The examples that you provided, things like lumber yards, I'm not sure have the same um, necessarily character as this may have, as far as uh, in a couple of ways. A Maybe view shed. I'm not sure. I think you're going to propose fencing, and there's going to be things that you can do to, to mitigate that. So I assume you can mitigate that. But one of the things we haven't talked about yet tonight, um, your application doesn't give us a lot of detail, but it references that you don't drain fluids from vehicles, that you assume that if they've been in an accident that all the fluids drained at the site of the accident. I don't believe that to be true. If anybody's seen tow trucks with vehicles leaving an accident, I can tell you that's not necessarily true. Um, so I think we need to understand a little bit more about the potentially hazardous materials and how you manage them. Your, your application does reference that you have a, uh, I want to say, I think it was a drip, drip prevention plan. Um, it wasn't a control plan, for, but it says that you use your drip prevention plan to address any spills at, at your sites. I think we need to know a little bit more about that. I think we need to understand a little bit more about that. And maybe not as much for, um, you know, your day-to-day your -day type business, but especially in the event of an unusual circumstance where you may have something like a hurricane and cars coming in, if there's any special steps that you take or, or measures that you would use when you're probably kind of just accepting cars that may or may not have been in places where they absorbed materials that might have been hazardous or something like that, just for us to understand it and understand kind of what that looks like. Um, as far as the use itself, Michelle, I'm, 
I'm going to look at you. I, this board does not normally, uh, unless it seems cut and dry to us, we usually defer to the zoning board to make any code judgments. Um, do you have a recommendation for us as far as whether uh, the description that allows the other similar uses is close enough to this, or should we refer it to the zoning board for a final determination for us? Um, well, I'll just just to be perfectly candid, when sure. initially, um, when Copart came in, they came in as a zoning verification, so they didn't even know what Copart was technically, and that was back in February or January of 2017. Okay. So when I initially looked at, at just as a zoning verification, this is what we're proposing as a use, very small description of your use, not knowing much about the operation, and putting it with our permitted uses, I would have said, uh, no, you know, this does not meet, um, you know, the the code because it is in an I1S district and just also a point of clarification, an I1S um, is pretty much exactly the same thing as an I1 except for an I1S allows airport uses. So that's the difference between the two of them. Um, so in this case, um, I, I guess my thought was that maybe we refer to the Zoning Board of Appeals because there's two issues. There's one, they have to determine if the proposed use would be consistent with the generally accepted definition of the term light industry, and then they also have to make a judgment on whether or not they think it would be beneficial to the town, or we have to make a determination of whether or not it would be beneficial to the town as a whole. So there's two separate questions to meet the criteria of the special permit, and it is a special permit. So it's not a, it's not a you know, permitted... Like an as of right use. Correct. It's a special permit. Okay. So, so with regard to hazardous materials, I think anybody who wanted to develop this site, we would have the same questions, right? What does your industry involve? What kind of chemicals do you, I mean, this is not an unusual or unreasonable question, but I think um, in your case, because you're, you're making a statement up front that says you don't have any spills, but then you're telling us about your drip prevention plan and how you deal with small spills on site. Again, I think we just need to understand that a little bit better. Um, and in, and it, if you provided that, it may or may not assist the zoning board in making a comparison to other uses allowed at the site to say, yes, it's minimal risk, it's similar, or, you know, no, we need to have some sort of special, and Scott, I'm looking at you, I don't know whether you could actually build drainage for a site like this or not that would have some sort of separator to keep chemicals out of the soil or what that would be. I don't know what that would look like because well, I mean, it just seems huge to me. Not knowing their but. business. Exactly, but I mean, yeah. to me, the simplest thing is if somebody uh, on site witnesses a vehicle comes in and makes an assessment, oh, this thing's leaking, then they take it to a special process area. Okay. It may be paved, may have an oil water so maybe one We've particular done that site projects for that. and, and pro basically process that vehicle. It may have a cracked uh, crankcase or something like that. And then yeah. once it's been cleaned or signed off, take it to storage. Okay. I don't think you want to contaminate. 75 acres with a right. car here, a car there, and a right. car there, and a car there. I think you'd want to confine them, at least process them, and then... Well, I think, and, and you know, it's a fair question. I think, I think the issue is this, that, and this is what I've been told, and I'm, I'm, I'm not a co-part person, I'm an attorney, and um, I've been driving cars, and I've had cars that have leaked even though they weren't <laughs> in accidents, but I, I think the bottom line is this, that f what, what I've been told, and, that, and there I have to defer to the experts, uh, and they have said that what happens is when there's an accident, what happens is at the scene of the accident, uh, and Tom can probably confirm or, or embellish on this, but at the scene of the accident, you have leaking fluids, okay? Then what happens is the vehicle's picked up, it's stored, so it doesn't go to cold part. It goes someplace else, and it's there for three or four days or whatever until they figure out what the heck they're going to do with it. The insurance company comes out and says it's totaled. You know, get rid of it, whatever. So it's there. So then it's it's a period of five, six, seven days before it ever gets to the Copart facility. At which time, they say, and what I've been told, 99% of the time, um, that that whatever fluids are leaking, they're out. They're done. Now, as far as what happens when they do an inspection when it gets there, I don't know. I don't know, Tom, if you can talk about that. But just so that you you know up now, and then we'll have to okay. confirm all this. I can speak a little bit to it. Um, yeah, so when you're in an accident situation, you know, these things, uh, uh, the fluids that leak out at the accident are generally cleaned up by those uh, tow companies that come and remove vehicles from the scene. Then the cars do go to generally a tow and storage yard or a body shop or wherever. 
Um, and they're going to be there for a period of three or four days until the, an adjuster calls it into us or somebody calls it in for us to go pick it up. And during that time, um, you know, people st st steal gas out of the cars, you know, use it for their own personal vehicles. Um, but we do have uh, protocols in place when the car comes in to visually inspect them and see if they are dripping. And then there's a response so that uh, we do have, I can supply you with a, a drip uh, protocol and an actual spill response. And, the, and these are not uh, uh, in response to, hey, every car that comes into our facility is leaking. We wouldn't be uh, environmentally conscious if we didn't have these protocols in place. Accidents do happen, so we're prepared to deal with those. Um, but there is, a, there is an inspection process that goes on when the car comes in, the receivers note that if these vehicles are leaking, then we're gonna take a step to try to stop it from leaking. But we have um, uh, the cars go, uh, and, and they, they actually have a drip pan put underneath them. The drip pan stays with the car until it leaves. The drip pans are cleaned up when the car leaves and uh, the fluids are disposed of, uh, you know, safety clean or any number of vendors that handle these types of fluids. So we have those protocols in place and the typical scenario, uh, you know, 99% of the time, the fluids that are gonna leave that vehicle leave at the scene of the accident. We don't do anything to the car when it comes to, to agitate that situation. It's gonna stay in a static situation at the yard. We're not going to handle it in such a manner to try to start something to leak that wasn't leaking. So there's no you know, that was a question I meant to ask. How do you move? The forklift. Pick them up with forklifts. You use forklifts. Yeah. So theoretically, a forklift could puncture a radiator. It could puncture anything once you start. Theoretically. So. Yeah. Then that person would be, and that person would be out of a job. But nonetheless, but to your point, though, if, if you're not going to handle a car in such a manner that might respond result in a spillage, I think just the mere fact that you're using forklifts could result in a spillage. Sure. Whether intentionally or not, it just could sure. nature nature of the handling yeah. of the car. Okay. It, it would help us to understand what your spill re response measures are, okay. what your pre spill prevention measures are, and then if you have particular ways on site, if you notice an existing drip, just tell us how you manage that from start to finish. Sure. I think that would help us I understand that a little better. Additional thing, I, I don't um, I noticed that in the EAF mapper that, and I and I I know that a lot of East Fish Hills are a principal aquifer, but I believe this site is as well. So that's another just added level of concern that I have because if we're over the aquifer here, it's very sensitive that we don't have um, contamination on the site, obviously. So I don't know to what extent you guys on other sites may have had similar issues or have other things that you, that you know there's other precautions that you can take. But I think um, this, because of the environmental sensitivity, not just the aquifer, but also just the large amount of surface water and wetlands on the site, I think it just adds a level of environmental sensitivity to the site that maybe some other sites you have don't have. So I diverted us a little bit as we were starting to talk about uses that might be similar to the existing I-1 zone, just to talk about the hazardous, um, potential hazardous materials on site. Michelle, can we just um, wrap up what our next steps should be as far as the actual determination of permitted use? Well, I guess I'm, I would also defer to Tom here, but I guess the way I was thinking about it would be that you would probably need to get some sort of interpretation of whether or not this use would be considered a light industrial use. And then I suppose it would be um, the planning board that would determine whether or not it would be beneficial to the town as a whole. But okay. the, I think the initial, in, uh, I don't know, Tom, would you agree with that <laughs> process? Because I think that that's the way so Is I that a referral to the ZBA or is that, okay. I just want to ask, I mean, when you said special use permit, I thought special use permit could be twofold. One, it could be for a use that is clearly not within the, the way that it is zoned. Or the second one would be that the town does not have any zone area that would meet these in your mind is there any one of the zoning codes that's available in town where this would not be a variance well it's not a variance a special right. permit that it would special fit. permit but just says but the town board says if you want a particular code. use it has to any other meet certain standards yes, this, this use is not contemplated anywhere <laughs> in the 
list of permitted uses. Answer. However, in large part because this is a newer type of use. I mean, this is a right. relatively it's a, unique it's use, so business. it's not likely to be permitted exactly anywhere. You know, we uh, so that was that's the question. Just, so the I'm answer sorry, is it doesn't fit into any of the existing codes as you know them. No. Thank you. Thanks. In my opinion, I think we have to take the information we received this evening and analyze it to make a determination as to how to advise the applicant. Either that it would be before this board to determine that you would grant this special permit or a question in the use and then it goes to the zoning board for an interpretation. But I do think that council has made some good points. I think your example, and I think we have to mesh the pros and cons of how this use goes against some of the enumerated uses and come up with a conclusion. But <clears throat> I'm not right of the mind now that it goes immediately to the zoning board. Okay. <clears throat> that's fair. That, and that's what I was trying to get the sense of whether it's within our purview to say, you know what, we're comfortable with the way this is described or whether we need it well, to I think for us to give you that guidance, we have to digest because most of this information is the first, That's fair. Uh, you know, really good presentation and answering the questions that I it, think we have to Is there anything that. else that we would yeah. need a request from the applicant other than the, the spell response and the prevention? Well, I, I have just a bunch of, I mean, I gave, I gave them a letter just kind of, I know that it was a very rough, you know, preliminary application, but I just noted some things that I thought that we might need just additional specifically for on. the zoning and the use. Um, Anything we need to be able to make a determination on that. Well, and then um, we can go over the other things for the site plan, but I want to. I just, yeah, I mean, one of the questions, just if, if any of the existing site buildings are going to be reused for any purpose, or are they all going going away? So that question, if you could just, because um, that might go to the use. Um. <coughs> No, I think I'll, I think that's it for use. Okay. And just to, just to answer that question, which is a good one, I didn't point it out, but um, there are a number of structures on on the property, both um, old residential structures and temporary structures that are used with the flea market. But the the idea is to raise all the structures on the property except for this uh, one, uh, which is a metal building, a more recent construction that uh, actually would be used just for some storage of, of uh, appurtenances. Okay. So. And if I just may, uh, lastly, uh, one of the things that we did look at was the, uh, uh, the uh, sections of your code, I think it's 194-28, maybe it's 194-32, having to do with uh, special permit uh, conditions and and frankly from my perspective looking at those conditions that's not the issue I believe we can satisfy all of those that's not a problem the issue is the use right. that's it and if we if we know uh, uh, whether we're uh, permitted use um, and you have a provision in your code which quite frankly I think we we do fall into by analogy um, then I think we, we can move forward, but if not, we'll find out soon enough, I guess, from you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. I Thank you. just have one question. Just, sure. just procedurally, I just have one question, and that is, you know, we'll put together the, the environmental protocols and some of the other um, broader issues which we think are, are associated with the use and resubmit. Um, as your council noted, you're going to give this a little bit of thought, so I, I would... Um, I would suspect that we're going to make our submission for your next meeting and show up and then be able to be given, I'm assuming, some clear direction on what our next steps are for the use. Is that fair? Next month, Michelle, we're, we would be prepared. To, and, if, and if we have a decision ahead of time, we can certainly let you know before that. I don't think we need to wait for the meeting to, okay. to be able to communicate. What will be your dead, what's the deadline for the? For the next submission? Yeah. For the end of the, the, working day, the, end of the month. Sorry? The last working day of the month of I knew. The last day of the month. Working day. Working day. Got it. That'd be, that'd be March, March 30th, right? Um, March 30th. Yes. 31st is a Saturday. Yes. Right. Thank you. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Are you good, Pam? Yeah. March no. 30. No, because that's Good Friday. We're, that's You're Good closed. Friday. We're closed. So make it oh. the 29th. It's the 29th. Oh. Thank you. Yes. It's <laughs> working. <laughs> Didn't think it out. <laughs> Okay. Thank you for the explanation and going through that was very helpful to understand it much better. Discussion. But aside from that, how did you like it? <laughs>
I just know the 31st is Saturday. Okay, the next item on our agenda is Gasland East Fish Kill Site Plan, Route 82. You're a busy guy. Yeah. I'm sorry if the wait was long this evening. That's all right. <coughs> Aren't you guys Statler and Waldorf from the Muppets? Come on, there's two I've never, I've never been here. Why I'm still here? Yeah. Beyond, no, that was beyond we are right now. Good evening. I'm Christopher Lapine with the Chazen Company, He's representing Gasland Petroleum this evening. Uh, oh, no internal oh. Lost the uh, connection. Shut it off. Somebody didn't pay the bill. Should I continue or should I wait for that to be reestablished? You know, I just Michelle. Do we have the regular images of the plan that we can bring I, up? I have the I images. I have a plan. I don't, I don't think we should need an internet connection to put them up on the. Right. Mm. right. You can go ahead and start if you yeah, want while well, Michelle's okay. doing that. Uh, I'll go back to this point here. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle. Sorry. Uh, Gasland Petroleum owns the 1.33 acre parcel located on Route 82 at the northeast intersection yeah, of the Taconic State Parkway and Route 82. The site is located within the G1 Business District. The site contains an existing 3,600 uh, square foot garage and was formerly a surface uh, service station. The site was uh, constructed according to county records in 1950. Um, the site uh, has an existing uh, open spill number from December 6 of 1999. I'm sorry, 1999. It had another documented spill in December 26 in 2017. The second spill was closed uh, a day after uh, with the uh, DEC. Do you know what happened? Uh, it was, there were test pits conducted and it was related to the fact that there was contamination from the previous spill, which was an indication. So they've only kept one spill number open. Gotcha. Okay. But, okay. Here. Okay. So closed is not synonymous with cleaned up. It just means oh, correct. You, you were satisfied that it was well, not. For that one new. number, there's still the other number. Yeah, there's still the other. Correct. Um, so. Have you provided us with the details on the spill? Uh, we gave you we a. That, uh, Michelle, I don't, did we have the spill copy so of the, uh, the details? On yes. Um, yeah, we can look it up, but I haven't looked at anything up yet. Okay, yeah. that's fair. It for the record, it's spill number nine nine one zero five seven four. Thank you. The site in general is located within a existing floodplain and is bordered by the Hordick Hill Creek uh, around the perimeter on the northern side of it. Um, the proposal here is for the construction of a 2,000 square foot uh, convenience store and three uh, pump islands and eight parking spaces the development would take place under the section 194-85 gasoline filling stations, which provides specific requirements for former gas stations in need of remediation and indicates a special use permit's not required for a site that requires remediation as long as the proposed site plan does not increase any nonconformities uh, associated with its uh, project. Mm -hmm. The uh, on-site uh, stream was delineated 
by Ecological Solutions. They provided a letter report that accompanied our EAF that there are no on-site wetlands within this 1.33 acre parcel. The access would be re via Route 82 and it would be strictly limited to a right in, right out only. At this time, there is no left turn lane uh, proposed along 82. Uh, there's been some dialogue with the DOT on this matter and the DOT has given uh, an initial uh, a conceptual approval of a right turn in, right turn out only for this particular site. Um, the, as I indicated, the site's in a floodplain. Um, so we've raised the building to be two feet above the floodplain to meet the uh, code here of the town of East Fishgill. So what you've seen here, there are some retaining walls and there was some regrading proposed uh, on the northern side of the uh, project area behind the building and there's also additional grading proposed on the um, eastern side as well. And the reason for that grading is for comp compensatory uh, volumes so that what we're filling by bringing up the site we're making up in terms of the floodplain volume that we're removing elsewhere on the site to do a balance of cut and fill almost f within a floodplain that you're required to do by FEMA anytime you're doing work in a floodplain. Uh, uh, water for the site will be served by a well, and we are proposing, and we've already submitted to the DEC for a speedies permit for an on-site small package plant for the treatment of the wastewater to be generated by the convenience store. Um, we have gotten some feedback from the DEC. Uh, they have asked us that if we can combine our submittal for not only the uh, speedies permit application, but also a stream disturbance permit from the DEC for our outfall. So we are scheduling a meeting with the DEC uh, to be on site so that they can verify the work conducted by Ecological Solutions, that there's no DEC wetlands on our site, and that would uh, require us, in the event there is no DEC wetlands, we would need a stream disturbance permit. We'd also need a permit to uh, work within their 50-foot buffer along with the speedies permit. We also understand that the town also regulates the 50-foot buffer uh, around uh, Horticill Creek, and we would be seeking a, uh, a permit from the town as well. <coughs> so is there no wetland next to the stream because it has steep banks, or what? I mean, usually we see like some measure of wetlands along a stream. Correct, this, you, that's an accurate assessment of the on-site uh, Horticill Creek on the site, that there are steep banks. Okay. So you can walk right up to it, and solid ground, right up to the edge and- But they still, down. they still, regulate 50 feet from that stream bank Correct. because this particular stream is also a trout stream. So it's class CT, which means they <coughs> take the buffer. If it wasn't a trout stream, they wouldn't take the buffer, but they do in this case. Okay. Chris, question if I could. Um, how bad is the spill? How contaminated is the site? Um, and by the way, thank you for cleaning this up. Uh, <laughs> but how bad is it? You know, I, uh, Without going through and doing the entire environmental investigation, this spill hasn't taken place yet. Uh, okay. So I, I can't, I can't ask, uh, give you an accurate description as to the volume that's being removed here. Um, uh, I'm just not out of. Okay. You, 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 you really don't know until you're actually involved in the removal of it. And uh, yeah, I you know, we just have a spill, 300 gallons in the Blue Hill gas stations. It's costing us $1.3 million. We're still do doing a cleanup over there by, by a truck. When you have a gas station, you have a spill, you can't tell how much until you open the ground. And as an owner, I'm not going to punch holes and open myself kind of warm, less if I do construction. Okay. Okay. This gas station I used to be active up to 1999, Amico. I remember the station well. And that gas station is 1950. And there's a spill number, 1999, wasn't double wall, steel tank, probably rodents. There's a pollution, and they used to fix cars there, and they used to store cars there like a junkyard, the Thu family, for all those years. So to open the ground, just like open a watermelon, I don't know how bad is it. How deep I gotta go, we gotta go to the underground. Maybe we have a pollution water. This area is polluted. Okay. Mitch, the, the report said that there was no record that the actual tanks had been removed. Do you think there's any chance the tanks are still there? The, when I bought the place, they told me the tanks are not removed. I did do some digging. I didn't see any tanks. But I seen some of my stations. I seen double 
uh, tanks, like two story, one on top of each other, stacked each on each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did a gas station in Highland where they moved the soil from one hole to put it to another fresh hole and they cover it with the plastic. And they usually the, the EC comes or environmental comes in, they go up just testing where they do the boring around the t uh, storage tanks. It's very vague. I mean, uh, they used to do oil change. This side has a double door. They come from the front and they used to go back from the back. It's all paved in the back. And it's double, uh, double garages. Uh, yeah, like two cars in each bay, oh. one after the other. And they used to do a lot of heavy, and I don't think the DEC even went inside the building yeah. for any fluid or transmission fluid, or an oil change. The, this is the spill for outside the building. Nobody checked inside the building where they had the bay, you know, all the concrete been cracked up and everything. Still there's oil cans, I clean as much as I can. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Chris, quick question, yep. the uh, on-site sanitary treatment, you mentioned you submitted to the DEC. Why don't you have to submit that to the health department as well? Or? Yeah, well, right now what we're trying to do is get a uh, criteria on what our uh, effluent limits are so we can select the proper unit to meet those units, okay, to meet those criteria. If, if the cleanup involves going into the stream buffer, is that typically allowed? Uh, for the discharge? Of no, the for the clean, for the spill cleanup. Uh, if the spill cleanup goes into the uh, buffer zone, you're saying of the, yeah. it's allowed, but obviously it's you have to get a permit for that. Right. And normally that's work, you know, as the, you know, I, I, I kind of. It's I, almost I, 20 years since the spill was open, so it could have migrated, right? It's kind of like may have to be the, in Cricket, the Cricket Valley Energy Plant's a great example of that. They have a cleanup adjacent to a DEC wetland. So they're doing the cleanup in the buffer as well uh, for the, uh, for the uh, on-site on parking during the course of construction. That whole okay. area has to be cleaned. So it's usually go hand in hand. They're just, you have to get a permit to do, do the work. Okay. But that yeah. won't, you, you won't know that degree of excavation until you're actually in the ground removing the soil. Yeah, no, no, okay. okay. But that, but that so, can be part of the, um, what I'm, I guess what I was trying to ask was, if it's necessary in order to complete the cleanup, you would be permitted to do that. You would be allowed to correct. do that he, by he, the agencies because they want you to he, clean he'd up. You'd have to continue chasing that until they they find uh, what's in the ground acceptable. Oh. Okay. But also, Lori, during the cleanup, there'd be a person from DEC present at the site, mm -hmm. plus with our, our our environmental company. There will be on a daily basis until the cleanup is clean, it's finished. Okay. But you'd mentioned that you're, you're planning on using a well. I mean, have there been core, uh, been sample wells done on the site? There's an so existing, there's an existing well on the site that's no longer active uh, because there's no uh, water on the property. Uh, we would be digging, we would be uh, drilling a new well uh, and we would actually have uh, probably put in at least 100 to 150 feet of casing in there as well. Uh, to, to prevent some any. contamination that getting into that, so. Okay. And, and the use is, is just a gas station or is it gonna be like a deli and? Uh, it, it's gonna be a convenience store and ha, have, you, have you made the decision on the deli yet no, or not? Deli, we failing. Not really deli, semi deli, just like yeah. breakfast, uh, basically, not like a full. Not a full scale deli. Not a full scale deli. Just Thank you. So you mentioned traffic is just right in and right out? Right in and right out only. So traffic coming from the south or from the Taconic, what do you expect it's going to do? It's traffic gonna, coming south on the Taconic? Coming, coming from the south. Heading off to heading or getting off the Taconic, it's going to have to pass by. They will pass by. Turn around. If, if, if they turned around, they'd most likely perhaps turn around in the existing uh, Dunkin' Donuts Plaza. Okay. Uh, but at, that's, that's the traffic light that I'm referring to. But we don't have the ability to get them into our site to take a left turn. Gotcha. Out. That would be a, uh, it'd be yes. prohibited uh, left turn. Yeah. 
And we've, we've shown that on our site. Prohibited plan. by sign, right? Yeah. You're not we've, saying you're going to put a curb down the middle of the road. No, we're not putting a curb down the middle of the road. Okay, we, so. We've got the signage on both sides of the road here. Mm -hmm. I mean, realistically, people will turn in. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And, I'm just saying. Yeah. and they'll make a left coming out of it, too. <laughs> Put a roundabout there, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, get with the program. Will work. Work. <laughs> so I take it you you don't need any special permissions from the owner of that parking lot or any other thing to well, get it, that traffic it, it, it's, 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 pulled in it, there. It, unfortunately, it's not. Uh, we don't have the ability to cater to that traffic. Uh, if they decide to frequent our site, how they? I, I don't know how. You know, perhaps they may go and. They may go up and uh, turn within the uh, park, the parking lot, or up at the AMP, or they may come on to Arthur'sburg Road and do whatever they may do and turn into the neighbor's okay. driveway. Okay. The other, the other uh, thing I did want to mention here is. Uh, with regards to the storm order, we've incorporated uh, some storm order features that consists of uh, uh, what's they're called? They're called media filters, and we selected one that particularly focuses on heavy metals, oils, greases, and organic compounds associated with this particular use. It's called a uh, zeolite, perlite, and granular activated carbon filters. That's for which part? This is for all the storm water from the okay. uh, impervious area would go through that. Okay. That's because of the proximity to the stream? It's good right? proximity to the stream and it's, 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 it's good practice, you know, in, in terms of the proximity to the stream and, the, you know, kind of what you just brought up in the last application is what do you, how do you handle potential drips that may occur or anything of that nature. Okay. Um, I think the one other thing, maybe a few other things we need to talk about, but let's um, let's talk about the law itself that permits you to build this. Okay. Um, it's currently under, I don't know, Tom, if you want to describe it, it's currently under litigation. We well, want to make sure you as the applicant there's a challenge to it, but there's understand. no stay, so they're free to proceed. So um, there is a Article 78 proceeding against the enactment, uh, and uh, but there is no stay from the court, so there's no nothing to prevent the applicant from proceeding. Did we want the applicant to understand that the litigation is pending and if it's successful, the law could be repealed? You're well aware of that. I'm well aware of that. And the okay. Article 78 from the usually competition, which is the very glorious, and you have the same attorney I have. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, I'm baffled by it. Yeah. Okay. Bean and bean. I mean, I Just as, as long as you understand. I understand it perfectly. Okay. okay. That gets interesting. Okay. It's very interesting. Yes. Because <laughs> it, it dramatically changes what you might be able to do here if that law is repealed. As long as you know, I, I, I just want just wanted to make sure you knew. Okay. The Taconic setback. Um, do you have that, the taconic buffer? Yes, it's 100 shown? feet, uh, and we meet that setback right there. Okay, does that include to the exit ramps too? Because I thought the exit ramps were also part of the, part of, considered part of the taconic, and I, I wasn't sure that you had the, the 100 foot from the exit ramp. Here's the 100 foot from the uh, taconic exit ramp, mm -hmm. and we have no building within that. In that. Okay. So, so no building, but I think that the setback requires no structure at all, right? Which, if that's driveway or whatever, we, we just need to understand that because I think we're not we're not allowed to put those types of things in this I, setback. I, well, I don't know if the driveway is classified as a structure I, according to the uh, code. I'll show you the language, and we yeah. can talk about that uh, that in the code. Are you expanding the impervious existing impervious surface with that driveway, or are you within the original paved surface with that western driveway? Um, let me see here. Or is something you have to take a look at. Yeah, I got it right here. The existing, oh, I, could, I could bring up on that. We are with probably give or take a foot. Plus or minus. 
of the existing pavement there? The language well, of the code <coughs> allows you to, to fall under the original bulk regs. Yes. Um, so we may need to make sure that you stay within the original footprint. If, if All our impervious on this side is within the original footprint because of the access that the DOT is dictating here in the right of way, I may be over plus or minus a foot. Okay. So All right. So we'll have to, site, but, but okay generally with within it. the existing site should be okay. Yeah, because the the language they're of grandfathered. The, yes, exactly. Got it. Okay. So this yes. is okay. We just here. need to make sure that maybe, uh, and if you've done this, I apologize. I didn't see, but we may just need to overshadow the ex the original okay. limits over your current plan, just so we can see that you're you're staying within it. We I'm not sure one. Point. You want an overlay for that? Yeah. yeah. I mean, we're just. I, I can. I'll. I can look at it if you have something even on the computer, or you can show me on a layer. You can just take off or put on. Yeah, I could, I could put a layer on for you. Okay, that's great. So, Michelle, that takes care of that concern as long as they're within the original site. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's talk about the uh, parking and ADA access number of spots as it relates to the square footage of the building. There's eight spots, which is one for every 250. And six filling and six positions, filling so that's 14 that's total altogether 14. on a 2,000 square foot building. So the code says one spot for every 250 square feet of general retail. Um, so it meets that technically, but then it has the additional six fueling spa spaces. Um, we know that at some of the other gas stations that it's tight for parking. So, but this does meet the code. Including employee parking? Because you're going to have presumably a deli and you're going to have a session counter, right? For It doesn't, we don't, we're, the, the code just says one space for every 250 square feet. So it doesn't actually have an aside for employee parking in this particular use. I know this site is tight. Um, where are your ADA spaces? The ADA space is right here adjacent to the building. Okay. And then we have the handicap and a clear accessible. walkway in without any other. Correct. Here, here's the uh, accessible space here. Here's the handicap ramp here coming right into the front door. Okay. Okay. And I'm assuming there's nowhere else on site you could put additional parking. Uh, one of the things we're going to talk to the DEC about uh, is the possibility of maybe doing uh, some parallel parking along here. Okay. Uh, I mean, if you're doing right in and right out only, you can control the flow of the site, right? You only need correct. like one traffic lane. Yeah, the, the width of this current is based upon the tractor trailer coming in, not necessarily the cars, the cars coming ways. in. Okay. And, you know, the tractor trailers are going to come in here. They're going to park here and unload and then access the way out. Okay. But one of the things we do want to can talk. Can you do it up on top, Chris, please? Oh, I'm sorry. One of the things we do want to talk to the DEC about is the ability to put some parallel parking in this location here. It's going to encroach within their 50 foot uh, buffer area and would extend the pavement outside of further further than where it currently is. Is there a curb along that line, that edge? There's, there's curb along that edge. There is. There's so you would trap anything. I'd be there. trapping it and bringing it back into my site anyway. <laughs> But I didn't want to be presumptuous and assume that they would approve something of that, so I didn't show it at this stage. That's fine. But you, you, are, you are talking to them about some additional spots if you the, the, Yeah, we, we, we want to try to utilize this as the best location here. Okay. We're trying to squeeze in two more. The, the guy, less, less employees than the former gas station. It used to be like four or five mechanics and people pumping gas. Now we're going to have three employees, two during the day and one, the, one during the night time. So the max employees, if we have breakfast in the morning for the deli, will be two people, and then evening is one person. And this is, they call it sea outlet. It's not a high volume station. I mean, there's one down the road, mm -hmm. and it's only one way traffic. Is it 24 hours a day? I would love to. 
-hmm. Usually safety 24 hours a day. I, I mean, I'm, I'm sure the guys... We proposed it, but obviously it's subject to I mean, the approval of the planning board. Okay. So of the parkways, I think safety for people. Yeah. You know, a lot of people on the parkway, the low on gas, they want to see 24 hours gas station. Yeah. I do have it at 52, 24 hours. Right. Is that, do you have your hours of operation in the application? I don't we remember do. reading that. We do. Okay. We've proposed 24 at this. Okay. Do we have your lighting plan too? Yes. And you're following the um, greenway for the canopy lighting? Yes. And I would just say um, because of your closeness to the stream and the potential for the Indiana bat habitat, which I know you guys are doing a, an assessment right now. Correct. Um, any lighting, if it could just be shielded in the back, they, they can just stick like a piece of metal so that it doesn't go. Nothing goes to the to, to the, the stream okay. exactly. So it kind of stays, and it it actually helps keep it the light forward. We can do that. I think the only area of concern is right over here, anyway, from our lighting plan because we have this shielded on this side. So. I think. Chris, just making sure, did you receive the comments from our Conservation Advisory Council? Yes. As and, well uh, as our Fire Advisory Board, which at this time just had the um, recommendation of a Knox box. Okay, yes, I think I have those as well. Okay. And we, we I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm not correct about it. It says the FAB recommends the building be provided with a monitored fire alarm system and a Knox, Knox box. Knox. If you need those comments, we can get you a copy of them. And I, I also received the comments from CAC, and we, uh, we spoke last week for about uh, 30 minutes on the phone. Uh, sorry, sorry. There was a number of okay. questions he had and just some clarification. So, uh, okay. And he asked that I follow up with him after our meeting with the DEC as well, the chairman. Okay. All right, good. And then um, you have Michelle's letter, and I think was there also, did we have a letter from Morris for this I one yet? I didn't letter, we? but I got Susan. I, I, I did yet. receive okay. Morris. We have a Morris letter. We, I received Morris's letter. Yeah. You did, okay. Yep. I didn't. Okay. Right. I just want to make sure you have all of the all of the letters. This will also go to know, the ARB. I don't know if they have a Hudson Valley Engineering letter on it. We, we don't have any don't comments. We've done, have we looked at traffic yet? So. Um, I'll say something, something about yet. traffic on this. If you remember during the Arthursburg Corner study, um, they contemplated development on this side <coughs> of the road as part of that study. So that was the, that was considered in the build out when they did the numbers for that traffic light. So it was always contemplated. And in fact, that's what helped make um, that traffic light meet the warrants that were required in order to install that light. So. The, the development of the site was always contemplated as part of that study. Okay. And what is mm. number 30? Isn't there like a traffic that references like a net gain of 30 cars? Yes. So you, you, have, uh, <coughs> you have the anticipated traffic volume associated with your type of business. Right. And then that it would draw. Okay. And then you take a look at what your existing pass by traffic is. Okay. And it so would that draw. was just the generic. It was not Correct. based on. Okay, thank you. And I, I have just a couple more comments. Um, just real quick. One is the refuse container. Yes. Um, we're just a little bit concerned about that location. I know it's really difficult concerned. for you to, to um, locate it anywhere else. But I maybe that's another something you can talk to DEC about because that location is probably going to be tight there. Where would you? Uh, for the pickup or too close to the buildings or? Um, I think it's going to be really hard for a truck to maneuver in there, especially if there's, you know, people, people at the, at the pumps. Station. Yeah. yeah. We, can, uh, we can look at other alternative locations. Uh, I, mean, I don't know that you're going to have another option, but I just. It's, yeah, just it's, it's the most ideal. We, we took a look. It, it works from the truck movement standpoint for a rail carting vehicle uh, that we use to uh, maneuver that. You, you're right, depending on the time. Is one day, one day a week. Put two dumpsters in well, well, do you have room for two dumpsters in there? It doesn't yeah, look like it. it. We have, no, we have one dumpster inside of there. Uh, Don't you need one for recycle and one for waste? But, but with, for the recycling one, we would go with the uh, smaller, smaller, smaller one in there. We wouldn't go with the 
Like, I look at when you, you he's talking about C stores <coughs> and A stores before of that nature. I'm looking at the. Wait, we have an A store here. We have a, uh, a refuse area that is about uh, 12 to 14 feet wide. Okay. And the sizes of the recycling and the refuse containers are larger. In this particular case, we're looking at one that's probably about five foot for the refuse, and then the re remainder of the space will be occupied by the recycling. Which would be, what's the remainder of the space? What's the width of uh, that, that would currently? Be four feet. How much? It would be, the remainder would be four feet. And a truck can go up to that and lift a four foot yeah, or, or they may, front? Yeah. We, we've had some where they're just working with the 55-gallon uh, containers as well. So how often do they come more than once a week, or what's the? <coughs> my, my experience, the, uh, <coughs> I thought he's saying 18 feet yeah. wide. You should go no. to dumpsters once a week. Right. And, and this gas station is not a 2,000 square foot or retail. It's about 500 foot, between almost five to 600 foot between storage, electrical room, and the, the, the walk-in coolers. And you get the gondolas, the counters, you won't have less than 1,000 uh, foot retail. It, it'd be similar to what you have on Vassar Road where they come once a week and it has a- well, Vassar Road and, is- And that has a Dunkin' Donuts in there. So. Well, I just think that needs to be taken a hard look at. And what yeah. about grease? What about a grease dumpster or a grease receptacle? We have no grease. Uh, grease. Oh, you're you're There's cooking no in the morning, though, right? Huh? You're making no, no. breakfast sandwiches. The, 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 usually, we put the grease trap either under the sink or outside, depends on the building department. The grease trap. Really that's the, that's the grease trap for. That's the, the grease sink. trap for, for the cooking. cooking. That's we have that on right, the plants. Like down in uh, John Jay, don't you have a separate grease? John Jay, we we, we did a, a full deli. We have a separate grease. Yes, and right. same thing. There is a grease trap outside this building right here, associated with. You're talking about a, a grease container is what I'm yeah. talking about. So where does that go? Grease tank for the cooking. That's what I'm saying. It's right it's over, over here. Yeah, it's right over there. There's a grease trap right here on our plants. Above grade with an enclosure type of thing? Maybe no, we have, a, we have a grease <laughs> trap. We don't have a grease holding grease. They're going to have a cold deli there for sandwiches, and they're going to be baking gas station, it. you have, have a... We have hot food. You have hot food. We yeah. Blue hot food. Eggs is hot food. Uh, sausage is hot food. No, but it's not oil. It's not frying. Okay. It's a difference. It's when you do so there's it, never going to be one of those containers there? No, this is... pop up. There's usually some time that we put one underneath the three-bay sink. Because I just want to take kind of what we learned down there and make sure we don't... He, he's referring to the holding container. No, I understand that. Okay. We do it both ways. Sometimes we put a 1,000 gallon outside and 99%, even Duncan Donut and everybody, else, we have a small little container that goes underground, in the concrete. And so you'll have to address that. The, yeah. Under we'll the three-bay sink. So it doesn't come up after the fact. Yeah. We want that all addressed. We do one now in Beacon. In you, 52, fiscal. You know what would help us? Can you give us a floor plan of what you're actually going to have in there yeah. so that we can look like we can look at all these different things and figure out if we need to ask you any more questions? Because I think that would help us. But the other, but the other things, let me just run through this quick. We don't have to hammer it out tonight, but like your air, if there's going to be an air pump, if there's going to propose to be a vacuum, like like well, we, popped we have, up down we have, below. We have the, the sure, let, me, let me just finish. Pro, uh, selling propane, you know, out of the cage propane tank, firewood kitchen sink, you know, all these things tend to pop up after the fact that we're not looking at at the planning board. We want to make yeah. sure we... We have the vacuum in the air pump is you shown intend. Let's talk about it now and let's figure out if it fits okay. or it doesn't the, fit. The air pump, we, we must have by West, it's a law yeah. by Western measure. Got to locate it. Yeah, we, we, have, we have the air pump. You have to the, approve where you're going to locate it. We have so the air vacuum, pumps and vacuum shown on the plants. You don't have to have vacuum. You don't have to have vacuum, right? I don't have to have that vacuum. Got the air, I have to have it by law. Yeah. What else do you say? If you're going to sell propane or firewood. Uh, firewood, no. Propane, yes. you got to locate that. Yep. Okay, so we don't yeah. want to have a sidewalk, you know, four foot wide for pedestrians, nope. and then all of a sudden it's propane like takes by up three feet tank. of the four No, we, we would put yep. those on the side of the building. <coughs> by the dumpster there. Yep. Okay. The, in, the initial application submitted before you just, for the record, does not have cooking or any deep frying going on within the building. That's kind of clarified in our EAF just for everybody. So okay. if we're going to modify that after tonight's meeting, I'll have this conversation with them. <laughs> so. okay.
Nawi. Blue and blue hell. Other deli we close. Close the deli and blue blue hell. I just want to clarify for the record what has been presented to you. Understood. So if you can provide the floor plan, you can show us that we understand that there's counter space and sinks and no cooking surface or. If he changes his mind between now and then, I'll let you know. It'll be shown on the plan. That's fine. Okay. So you've got a few things you're going to do. It sounds like the habitat study is in process. It's actually completed and uh, we're ready to submit that. Uh, okay. So I can uh, submit that to you. Okay. So we have that. You're looking at the refuse location, a lighting plan, um, a floor plan. Do we have for our application? I know you've told us tonight what the intended use was, but I, I think just. Um, let's make sure that we update the narrative of the application to just explain it's going to have a small deli, but it's not going to be cooking. It's going to be for let's breakfast put a deli. only. This is like a continental deli, like a continental breakfast. Okay. It's not a full deli. Let's, let's just have you clarify that then in your. The bagel cream, uh, you know, That's bagel, fine. butter roll, and, and eggs. Okay. And, uh, it's not like full balloon with uh, no grill. Well, huh? But if it's There's eggs, no are you? Well, there has to no, be no grill, no, no, uh, no cooking? frying. So grab and go, and is it electronic grill? It's not the real. We'll clarify it. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then, um, so go ahead, go ahead sorry. Michelle. Sorry, I was just going to say um, we need to make a decision. I, I don't know if we want to circulate now for a lead agency or if we want to wait until they have submitted and you get more revised plans. Um, is it going to take you long to resubmit the plans? No, we're these. Do you have the floor plan already kind of laid out that it's something? It's, yeah. Okay. But and I you have the we, habitat study ready to go. So habitat study is. Shall maybe we go. could make the motion, but motion on the assumption that we get the updated information from you that like we've to, talked about we tonight. I'd like to send all of it at once. It's just better that way. Right. I, I think the lighting plan, with the exception of this I mean, small little area right here, we go down to 0.02. So, I mean, we're like five feet in back of the refuse area. I think it's sufficient enough for circulation without needing to modify just, it. If that's one of the concerns of the board, just clarifying that. The only issue I was thinking is if, you, if the DEC and you decide to change anything, but they would be aware of that theoretically, it's just yeah. that. I mean, we would just go down to zero five feet away from the back of the refuse. Everywhere else over here, we're at zero along your, it's a very small area. No, I just meant the disturbance area might change if you if they allow you to do the parking. Oh, okay. But I mean, that since you're going to be meeting with them specifically on that, when when is the meeting? Is it soon? Um, it's probably going to get postponed because of the snow. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. okay. We had our first one postponed oh, you mean because tomorrow? of the snow. Um, so. I mean, right. I, we could circulate. We could. I mean, you could. I'm sorry, not circulate, but declare yourself your intent, and then we can figure out when to circulate when. The but plans I'm, are I want to make clear we circulate once we have some of this additional information, you, you, rather than you, having agencies come back and say they want more information. It's easier if we can do one. You, you'll have the revised plans by Thursday of next week. Okay. Soft copy. Soft copy. <laughs> so I remember the board, and I need to talk to Pam. With to however many hard office. copies Pam yeah. needs for the planning office, to be clear. Um, okay, well, so do I have a motion to? Just, sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. Just real quick, I just want to touch upon. We did a preliminary uh, look at the uh, floodplain development permit that'll be required, and uh, just to let Chris know, and, and you'll get the copy of this memo tomorrow. We just wrapped it up today, but just um, a couple of the concerns was just to take a look at uh, buoyancy restraints mm -hmm. on uh, buried. Fuel tanks, so you'd probably do that anyway, but yeah. any components of your septic or Correct. anything that you got subsurface, take a look at buoyancy. But you said you're not doing septic, right? You're doing a. Well, he's going to have a tank that's going to We'll be have a concrete that tank that that'll float right. up, you know, that kind of stuff. Okay. Um, I think there was a concern about your stormwater system, whether or not uh, during a flood or a rain event it would be submerged and be able to discharge the site. So, you know, we'll have to take a look at that. I'll, I'll get you this memo. Okay. Um, and then scour protection to be provided on these retaining walls and, and maybe the back side of the building, whatever, just to mm -hmm. preserve them in case of flood waters. And uh, special care for your concrete washout area that you've uh, illustrated on the plan, but because we're so close to the stream, just to. Yeah, we have some additional notes on that maybe too. Maybe beef that up a little bit. Yep. But we'll get you a copy of this tomorrow. Okay. okay. That's great. But all in all, we should be able to. Issue that permit provided you, you meet all that stuff. Yeah, we're, we're approximately uh, the compensatory of volume was about 750 yards. Okay, 
That's another comment in here. And we can yeah. give you those uh, calculations. Okay. I'm sorry, Scott, what is that, the permit called, Ian? Floodplain development. development. Right. Floodplain development. Okay. So do I have a motion to circulate for lead agency? So, so moved. moved. Second. second. Got a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. What we'll do is, um, as soon as you have the revised plans in, Michelle essentially complete, we'll, she'll coordinate with you and we'll help okay. make sure that gets sent out. Excellent. Um, Chris, I can give you one eight. And then, Michelle, I think one more discussion and then we would be able to schedule for a public hearing. But I, I want to see the revised plans. It sounds like there may be some things that move around on the site, so I, I think yeah, one, more, we'll see what one more discussion. Do you, do you want me to, for now, show that parking? Those two additional spaces? Sure. I would. I, I would show them as yeah. tentative, pending, like approval. You know, you could just put, put a footnote on it that it's pending approval or, or okay. of a permit to um, develop in the setback. You've done circulation. It shows that a fuel truck can navigate <coughs> that site without having to back out onto 82. Yeah. You've done that? Okay. And that's assuming the cars are they are getting fuel? And the cars are there getting fuel. Okay. We have enough space between the two to pull in. Okay. Okay, good. Excellent. Do you have other questions for us? I think that's it for now. I've got right. my work. That's good. Yes, sir. Basically, in my gas stations, we usually have a small uh, lease trap tank underneath the three basins. Sometimes when we have a deli, we have a 1,000 lease trap outside the building. Okay. They and they made me put thousands. Uh, health department did, yes. Yes, health department. But over here, in this matter, this kind of gas station, we need only the small one. That's going to be a health department. Oh, how do, uh, so we can do it either or. I mean, uh, it's going to be a health it. department in D, sir. Yes. 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 They're, they're going to. If you were connecting <laughs> into a municipal sewer, we would review it. But you're not. It's a private system, so. They're, they're going to. Just so you're aware, they're going to make you do the same thing they made us do on Myers Corners for the DC and DOH. Regardless of what you're doing here, it's minimal. Okay. They're going to make you put in a thousand gallon grease trap. We did a similar facility in the no, town of Wappingers. Okay. Where they made us do that. We're under construction now in one of the same plan. So. Hmm. Okay. okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Chris. Good night. Anything else for the agenda tonight? I think you have a motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. I have a motion to adjourn and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Blank. I didn't ask for any opposed, if you noticed. Yeah. <laughs> I'm assuming no one's opposed.